Uh, my name is Akima Price and I am a, gosh, it's so hard for me to say what I am because I don't feel like I fit in a box. Um, but if I were anything, I would say I am a nature engagement specialist. I look at how to use nature-based experiences to help stressed, economically stressed African-Americans break cycles um, from poverty, um, the mental health, the physical health factors, how to use nature-based experiences to address that. We are in the United States of America in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C. has a very interesting nature. It originally was on swamp land, and there are these two major rivers that kind of encapsulate Washington, D.C. On the north side, um, you northwest side, you have the Potomac River, and on the southeast side, you have the Anacostia River. And the Potomac River is 300 plus miles of a flourishing river, whereas the Anacostia River is 8.5 miles long. So it's a tributary of the Potomac River which then ultimately empties out into the Chesapeake Bay, into the Atlantic Ocean. The, the neat thing about the Anacostia River, though, is that it was very important in the development of Washington, D.C., as ocean-going vessels would go all the way up to Bladensburg, which is at the head of the river, and tr transport everything from spices to people. Um, and so early on, that river was used and was not necessarily protected. And so it got a lot of sedimentation and became like this forgotten river, especially in the, once it got what it needed in the development of DC came up. So the Potomac River became the backdrop for the capital and for all these things that, that Washington DC are known for. But Anacostia being on the Southeast side became this forgotten river. And in that, you know, became a place where, I mean, like after the Civil War, there's a place called Berry Farms, which was one of the first places that African-Americans could even purchase land. And so the Nacotch tanks were there before the African-Americans and kind of around the same time, but primarily the same story for both were, you know, um, European settlement and, um, you know, just an overtaking of the land and an overuse of the land led to the degradation of the land, which included, again, deforestation, sedimentation, and then mucking up this Anacostia River. And so once these uh, lower income communities were over on that side, it just, be Southeast became known as just not the place to be. You know, at one point, Washington DC was the capital, like the gun violence capital of the murder capital of the world. And so during those times, a lot of that was happening in those Southeast communities. But at the same time, those Southeast communities are on coastal plain. Whereas the side over past the mall and getting up into the more affluent communities was Piedmont Plateau. And when you really think about it, the land on the Southeast side was way more nutritious. It was way more fertile. And it was, you know, the, the views that you could have from that side, it was very sought after. But at the same time, you know, a lot of these stressed communities, economically stressed communities were there, which ironically now, you know, Southeast is a place of gentrification because people want those views and want that land. Um, so, but in between those two times, you know, there was a lot of um, work to protect lands around that. So Anacostia Park, thankfully, was about 102 or three years ago, was solidified by the Park Service as a national park. It's a part of a larger group of parks, National Capital Parks East, which include the Frederick Douglass Home, which is walking distance from Anacostia Park. Um, some of these historic forts that were very instrumental in protecting Washington, D.C., in some of these earlier times, and even the War of 1812, you know, Anacostia, the Anacostia River played a part in the War of 1812 as a place that people were coming up to try to do a sneak attack on Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of history, you know, good and bad, centered around Anacostia. And so, you know, I grew up in Southeast D.C., um, and so I just automatically kind of was in that area. And so a lot of the streams I played in and the parks I played in were connected and actually emptied into the Anacostia River. And um, I can also recall spending time in Anacostia Park as a child because it's this, you know, very flat park all along a river, but it was just an amazing backdrop and had already, even previous to me, became a very historic place for African Americans to converge and fellowship. There was Malcolm X Day, um, there was the Black Family Reunion, and, and even ironically though, there was a one point in, in time where Anacostia Park was segregated and Afri African Americans weren't even allowed in certain sections of Anacostia Park. 
Um, but then fast forward to like 1947, I think it was, there was a big pool riot that happened at a park, uh, at a pool in Anacostia Park, um, a race riot, that after that race riot, um, there was movement around segregation. You know, that park is just super historic. It's incredibly important and valuable to the African, African American community. But at the same time, you know, it's not this pristine national park that gets all these resources and attention. And so the need for the Friends of Anacostia Park came about a long time ago, but it took a lot of work and fundraising. And so in 2018, I was hired by the National Park Foundation to help set up a friends group, which are like nonprofit entities that are created to help fundraise for capital improvements and infrastructure improvements in national parks specifically. I was hired in 2018 to help build this friends group, but um, they were think they had something different in mind because unlike most of these national parks, I mean it's an urban national park, but it's the borderline communities of this park are Ward 7 8 communities, which have some of the highest levels of obesity, poverty, lowest median income. You know, so these are economically stressed African American communities with all these challenges, right? But have this incredible national park in their backyard. And so again, while they've been using the park, there is a need to bring the park up a bit to you know um you know catch up with the times but be be a form of redevelopment that's not necessarily based in um, gentrification but instead community informed park improvements that help make the park more accessible more safe more usable like some of the infrastructure things like the bathrooms need a lot of help you know and these are million dollar projects but the other side of what we're doing and i think the reason why they they hired me to do this was they wanted an innovative friends group that wasn't just focused on raising financial capital but also considered the value of social capital and human capital of these neighboring communities because what i was not going to do was going to fundraise for ask for people you know low-income people to give money to help federal land. Like it just doesn't make sense because most people are like the government has all this money. Why do you need me? And so, you know, what we were able to do was start with this um, really informal I Love Anacostia Park campaign. This was before we even had our 501c3 status. I just created a t-shirt that said I Love Anacostia Park with a big heart. And this was around um, a little bit of like COVID-ish, before COVID, uh, George Floyd, but the need for that symbolism of love and togetherness was really important. And so that's why we just had the heart and the heart to this day, we have a, a different version of it, but is our logo. Because the idea is all these people, all these African-Americans that have historically used this park for cookouts, family reunions, memorial services, all these things. How do we take that love that they have for the park, right? And turn that into this capital. So this was an informal challenge to people who, we gave out thousands of shirts and they were like, I love Anacostia Park. Okay, well, if you love Anacostia Park, one, how does this park show you love? And then how can you show this park love, right? And so what this looks like is, you know, we realized people felt like this park showed them love because it was a safe place for them. It was a place they could come get peace. It was a place they could come walk. They could fish and take their mind off their troubles. They could lose weight by walking. They could get off diabetes medicine and prolong their life from use of this park. They could skate. That's another thing about Anacostia Park. We have, we're the only, um, net, well, the only skating pavilion in a national park, but it's waterfront. It's amazing, right? And we're the only park that has this, a kennel, the Kennel with Aquatic Gardens is a part of Anacostia Park. And it's the only park with water lilies um, and lotuses, right? So there's this, this park is incredibly historic, it's incredibly important and needed, but it was just incredibly under-resourced by the National Park Service. So the National Park Service, again, saw fit to, to build the Friends of Anacostia Park. Uh, everybody here has an interesting story, a community expertise. Speaking of stories, um, I've known this young lady since she was nine years old. This is Kayla Watson. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Akima. <laughs> Um, I started working with Kayla. She was at the Kennel, she was in Kenilworth, and so she was a part of the work I did at the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. We did year-round programming, including after school. Um, you know, we tried our best to make it meaningful. We worked with the kids in the neighborhood, and it wasn't just about teaching about the bugs and the trees. It was more so about helping them learn how to work together and control their anger and things of that nature. Kayla, can you talk a little bit about that experience? So before I got to the program, I probably would say I was just misunderstood. I wasn't bad. I was just more misunderstood. So being around Miss Akima kind of guided me to where I needed to be. Like I kind of now want to work with kids. So it was like destiny when I ran back into Miss Akima and I get to work with her again. So it's just like it did a 
better thing for my life than what I imagined that it did and I didn't know until I'm here at 30's door like hello life <laughs> life is smacking me but like all those lessons from back then no it, the camp was not just about bugs it was about friendship um, being clean keeping your environment clean um, I learned about so many animals and bugs that I didn't know about so it's like when I see him now I could teach my son so yes it definitely had a life impact Okay, so my day-to-day -day is I just greet the kids, hello. I'm more so closer to the age, so it's like I'm more hip. So I just try to be more of a friend. I try to be more of a friend than a, a guidance counselor or like a, a big sister. I try to be like a friend. I try to guide them and let them know the things that you can do. Or you could take this outlook or you could have this outlook. It could be different. You don't have to just be so angry or... Whatever the case may be. So I include my child in the program because he needs help with his anger. We all need help with our anger. I'm still growing. We're all still learning. So I give the kids that opportunity, and that's all they need is the opportunity to just keep being helped at, 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 at all costs. Like, just help them at all costs. And so I made the major goal of this work and my work is to use um, nature as a medium to help people address human development needs and the, the overwhelming need to break cycles of, of trauma in, in these communities that are neighboring this incredible national park. And, and you know, I think these people were already using this park for these things inadvertently, but how do we consciously use it and even set forth national models for other places to use park spaces in stressed African-American, not even just African-American, but stressed communities, like how can people use parks to help heal themselves? And in a part of that healing, you know, I think you, you know, capitalizes on just the natural magic that you, that happens when you're outdoors and when you see a bird fly or when you can watch water and when you don't have to be worried about, you know, am I safe? So today we organically come upon Sister Charnal. She has um, a business called Bold Yoga. She's from Ward 8. She um, has also had a, a stressed life, but she has been incredibly resilient and found a space and a niche in this work where she does not only yoga work, but she helps stressed kids um, use yoga as a way to help modify their behavior so they can, you know, avoid problems, um, make better decisions. And she, she, so one of the things that drew me to her was she was already using Anacostia Park without me even knowing who she was or her knowing who I was. She was using a space down there where she was bringing families together to do family time and yoga in the park. I met Akima when we did a meditation session over at Oxford Run Park, I mm -hmm. think. And she just was so genuine and just like, I just want to bless you. I was like, yes. Yeah. So, so it's, it kind of built from there. But I got into the park because, I don't know, it was just something about being down in nature that was just healing when I would do my yoga, when I would meditate. And then it went to me taking naps at the park. And it was just like, I would wake up and I would feel like so different. So I was like, started inviting other people down into the space and then... Next thing you know, like now it's grown us so much. So it's definitely been a blessing, like having the friends at Oxford Run Park here because like my kids done learn how to skate because they got the skates here now. They come down here. This is like a second home to us. Like we come down here and just chill just after just, and y'all make it so homey. So thank you for everything you've done. And I'm also inspired by her too. Just like what I've seen when I met her and where she at now is just like really dope what it you could tell that they're here at the park now whereas first it was like okay but just ain't across the park ain't nobody really show this park no love no more so having her here you feel the love that's restored back into the park yes thank you i didn't want this to be about me though i know right i know right I so but, but did somebody introduce you to nature or did you just find nature because because again you were stressed youth mm -hmm. did you stumble upon nature and go this feels good did somebody take you on a trip like did you have somebody introduce you to nature in a particular way? Um, no, the park was just like one of the most open spaces, free spaces that you could kind of just go and just be like the yoga studios. You got to have money to be a part of it, to have a membership and all of that. So I just used the park and I realized how healing it was. And then I would start to get in certain spaces and they would say, oh, the trees have spirits and hug the tree. One time this lady told me, you need to go hug a tree. I was like, hug a tree? <laughs> like, and then I learned about tree hugging. So it was like, after I started doing it, it was like starting revealing to me why it was come, giving off that. Then I met you and you like, you draw so many lines for me. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew it was helping me.
Well, I'm so glad that our paths crossed, and I right. look forward to other innovations. So, so something else I want to mention. So they, the, the D.C. Department of the Environment, Energy and the Environment, puts out these stormwater grants. And traditionally, the stormwater grants are appealing to environmental groups or homeowners. And, you know, people made noise about that, and they started opening it up and tried to make them more accessible to everyday people. And so they opened up the grant requirements to where you could do a little more innovation. And so we worked with Charnal to put together some proposals on how she could qualify as a you know, community-based yoga uh, instructor or wellness leader to go after green dollars. And although we didn't get the grant, it was for technical reasons. It wasn't because the content wasn't good, but it gave us that chance to come together and come up with these really creative ideas around like uh, watershed yoga or where you're talking about the water process, but you're connecting it to stretches and breathing. <laughs> and also we had one on um, meaningful, uh, meaningful cl river cleanup, yeah. but where we actually talk about like the mindset when you drop trash and just the traveling of trash down into the river. So again, bringing that meaningful element to make it relevant to our communities, because a lot of times our communities aren't coming out to do cleanups and our communities aren't asking for more information about watersheds. But if we can start to bring that into these practices where you already got them open about other things, yeah they could become aware of that. So I, I, I'm acclaimed that in the future, you're gonna get some of these green dollars, girl. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> so thank you for this. Another value of the Friends of Anacostia Park is you know, we have this workforce development model where we've started a core of people that are from the neighboring communities who are stressed, and we provide these opportunities for them to bring their community expertise, right? So we have jobs that extend everything from ground support, which is where you are doing litter cleanup, or helping build picnic tables or helping remove invasive species or, you know, um, attending to the restrooms, making sure things are nice, that the toilet's not overflowing. But then we've also got very informal community and visitor engagement, which includes, you know, a couple weeks ago, there was a woman in our park who just looked distressed. And, you know, one of our workers, because she's from the community and didn't have on a uniform, could walk over and talk to this woman and found out that, you know, the woman brought her daughter there to skate with her friend because her dad was killed two weeks earlier. And so that they just naturally were drawn to this park space to just come and be, and just the solace and the comfort that they got from having you know, access to this park during those times. And you know, we can't fix these situations that are impacting these people, but we can be very intentional about how we show up for them when they're in our parks. You know, that we do greet them. We greet them with warm regard. They feel included, they feel special. And if nothing else, the bathrooms are working, the grounds are clean, the skates are available. You know, like all these other factors that allow people to come and which seem like, you know, very everyday simple things, but are really key places in their lives where they need that kind of support. And it just, it's amazing how these things match up and how, how so many people love nature and love these parks on their own, own terms. But when you're trying to frame it through, if they're not kayaking, it's not important. Or if they're not doing this, it's not important. We miss all these other ways that people are using parks and natural places that I think, again, could inform national practices around trauma-informed engagement in national parks. Back in 2014, um, I kind of called myself leaving the environmental education field because I kept coming up against people who were saying my work wasn't environmental education. And, you know, I knew what I was doing mattered. I knew that this meaningful work was needed. I could tell because every time I worked at these environmental organizations, they would bring the funders to see my work. But when it came time to really do the work to shift, to make it uh, a part of the culture, it, it was people were resistant to that. And so I got tired of fighting that. So I left the field and I went to work with the social service organization called the DC Promise Neighborhood Initiative, which was over in the Kenilworth Parkside Mayfair community in Washington, DC, which is primarily made up of stressed communities. And so when I was there, I went there because I, was, I wasn't a social worker. I didn't have a background in social work, but I, I felt like social work was the answer. Like that was the missing element to this work. And I was thinking like a social worker, but didn't have the expertise. And I was hungry for the knowledge. So I went to be around social workers at a social service organization and lo and behold I crossed paths with this amazing woman um, Carol Gilmore how many years have you been in the game Carol 22 years so she had 22 years in social work but um you know I'm sure off the break you kind of looked at me because so first of all the job I took was a health and wellness coordinator 
I was a coordinator, so I went from being this nationally recognized leader and, you know, contractor, and I decided, you know, it, it wasn't about the money, it was about the experience, and so I took a coordinator position, and these people didn't know who I was. Um, and so I ended up working with Carol, and what I did was, because the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens was near in this neighborhood as a park, I uh, chose that as the space for us to start doing this work. And so we were in the Family and Community Engagement Office. Mm -hmm. And so when you first learned about my work and we were talking about park-based experiences, as a social worker, did that immediately resonate? Did you see the value or were you kind of like, hmm? So it was a little bit of all of that, right? Um, for me, it was more so knowing the value of being in parks and green spaces um, and how that could be perceived as a space of, you know, a therapeutic space or a healing space. And so I knew that there was, you know, some connection there. Didn't necessarily, you know, make the connections in terms of what this would actually look like in practice um, until we started doing the work. And when we started doing the work, it was like, oh, this is a no brainer. <laughs> so, yes. How do you, though, as a social worker, like how would you promote, how would you talk to other social workers? What would you say to encourage them about the benefits of using nature-based experiences in their practices? I would say absolutely do it. Um, it's one of those spaces of kind of thinking outside of this box of social work. Um, you know, being creative of, and looking at ways that we can connect with people in their spaces. Um, looking at ways that we can connect with people outside of the walls of our office building, right? Um, being able to have an environment that will just naturally, organically, you know, um, foster that space for creating trusting relationships, right? And so, and that's what makes a social worker uh, successful in whatever arena that they're working in is when they're able to build strong relationships with the people that they're working with. And so, you know, coming into a park, coming anywhere near nature, is j it just, you know, puts you in a space to where, you know, you just kind of, you're at ease and, you know, things begin to naturally happen. So that's why I, I would definitely say, yes, every social worker should consider, you know, utilizing parks and green spaces in their work. So Carol's currently with an organization called Jobs Have Priority, and they work with uh, folks who are TANF recipients, which stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Absolutely. And so part of their job is to help folks actually build out job skills, um, become employed, kind of get in a place where they don't need assistance anymore. And so that workforce element of green jobs, I know, has been something that you've been interested in opening up a bit more. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, the reason why um, I saw value, again, being able to partner with an organization like Friends of Anacostia um, Park is, you know, being able to expose people to, you know, different um, industries of service. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, folks, again, get stuck in a box thinking if I have limited education, I have limited skills, you know, it's, I can only do retail, I can only work in a restaurant. Um, not necessarily thinking that I could go in my backyard and actually work and earn a wage doing so. Um, so being able to expose individuals to this type of work um, is very valuable because then that gives them another you know, pathway to be able to come out of cycles of poverty. Correct. Um, another way I see that you have been useful to us is as we build our workforce development model, like we are definitely following some of the traditional you know, grounds training on how to you know, care for parks, some very informal visitor engagement um, work, but also how to um, work with people, because we, we, we're hiring from the community. So nine times out of 10, these folks are coming with stresses. Absolutely. So you've been very helpful with us around the human development lens of like, how, what truly, what truly makes somebody employable? Is it just like, it's not just the skills? Oh, absolutely not. Um, it's what a person just brings with themselves, you know, um, just being able to have that drive and motivation to want to be in a space to where they can collaborate with the team, to where they can, you know, again, be exposed to something new that then, you know, kind of just motivates them to want to, you know, curious, be curious about, you know, what this work is and um, be able to find themselves in a space to where they really like it and they can stay devoted to that, right? Um, so, you know, and everyone has something that they can offer, you know, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just a skill that you can just 
immediately look at and try to pull out of someone. I mean, it could be, you know, simply as, you know, being able to speak to someone um, and engage someone in conversation. Um, it could be, you know, someone who likes to, to clean in their homes and now they can clean in a park. You know, it could be anything, you know. So it's um, not just one set skill or anything that you need to be able to bring to a space like this. Just bring yourself. Right. <laughs> and that's the other thing, too, is like we've been trying to expand green jobs, not just to be about picking up trash and not just about the visitor services. Um, and you guys actually, you know, I think too, you have a lot of folks in your network that people make assumptions about people who need services that they haven't been to college or that right. they haven't graduated high school. Right. You have some college degree holding people Absolutely. that you've been able to bring into this work who Absolutely. had never considered working in a park. Absolutely. I, one thing I did notice early on too is just the informality of this, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not like a traditional job. Sure. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you build people to show up professionally to an informal job? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you lead by example. Um, that's one, right? Um, when you have people that come together with a shared um, kind of goal in mind, um, everybody's working for the same purpose. Uh, I think, you know, you begin to want to perform to a certain standard. Um, everybody wants to be able to do good and, and be good and be good at what they do, right? And so, in that sense, whether or not it's a traditional, you know, work environment or not, if you have that sense of, you know, I want to be able to show up, you know, doing my best for my team, for the people that come and visit the park, you know, that then puts them in that space of being able to say, okay, there's a certain level of, you know, a standard I have to hold myself to, certain level of. Prof professionalism that I need to exude, if you will. So I think those things kind of happen, um, even when you don't have to necessarily, you know, structure it out in the beginning, it, it kind of organi organically happens too. What are some successes that you've seen in some of your clients that you've engaged in this work with us, or just even engaged in parks? What have you heard from them that, what's, has there been any transformative elements to this experience? Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, the exposure to you know um, being able to to say I could I worked in the park <laughs> you know um, now knowing that this is an option right um, gives them motivation to you know look at other options beyond this um, and then you know not only that you know you see people who have come in you know probably just you know really reserved and you know don't want to say too much but then they've blossomed over time and now you can't get them to stop talking to people right, right, right. you know um, because it, it's just that you know you come into a space where you, you you get what you need that you didn't think you needed you know at the time right mm -hmm. and so and it, it fosters that growth and development and so you know it's it's I've seen a lot of growth from individuals that come through this space. So how important is it that the, the social work industry grow to see parks in their continuum of care? Uh, it's extremely important because, again, this is a space that's not restrictive in any kind of way. Um, this is a safe space that people, you know, um, are familiar with. Um, you know, they are, if they're, if they haven't already been here, you know, kind of hanging out with family and, you know, things like that, to be able to see it in a different light of healing in, in that sense is huge, right? Um, that's transformative in itself. <laughs> My last question, because you as a social worker, how would you, would you classify cookouts as therapeutic? Absolutely, because that is gathering time, that's social time, that is time when you feel good. Um, you're not thinking about, you know, anything else um, other than having a good time with the people that you're with. Yeah. Um, so absolutely therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying um, earlier, someone asked me the question, how do I manage my own self-care and being in this space? And I said, I'd like to look for, you know, as many enjoyable moments as I possibly can and coming together with the team and cooking out and fellowshipping together, that's an enjoyable moment and it's very therapeutic and healing for me, so I'm sure it is for others as well. Thank you, Carol. So we've been bringing in justice-based partners or social service partners, mental health partners, and within that world, there's something called a continuum of care, which is where like, you know, you have this long-term plan for how to invest and help this person heal. We've got these groups now that see Anacostia Park as a place 
a valued place to, to include in their containment of care. So these park experiences are counting on a larger measure than just, you know, how many how many hours they spend outdoors, but more so, you know, a lot of court mandated mental health, um, restorative justice um, experiences, you know, things where the park is just a backdrop but for some very heavy experiences that, you know, it makes all the difference to be outdoors versus being inside of a building. One of my future goals for this work would be to even have like family court judges, you know, assign family experiences in the outdoors. There's been a lot of work done around um, writing prescriptions for being outdoors, but even in that, you get parents that you, that'll go to a park and don't know what to do. So building up the park professionals and having people like the Friends of Anacostia Park in that park to then greet these visitors and welcome them into sort of these innovative ways that you can be outdoors. Some of it is very intentional though, though like we're, we're working on this series where we have these book bags for parents who are coming home to come out and like if you, got, if you get trained in these three book bags, those three book bags are like four hour lessons with your or activities with your families, that's 12 hours that you can put into a letter to go to your judge to say, hey, I'm really trying. But again, in my vision in the future, like this judge has already got Anacostia Park on their list. And so it's just like one more place that's just as important as a, a clinic or a hospital that people seek out services in and are, you know, go to and count as valid healing experiences that, you know, you don't have to be a licensed therapist to get the level of therapy that could come from a nature-based experience in a park. So one level of, of some of the engagement we do is just empowering the parents to be the leaders. Like we don't have to always be the teachers. Like owl pellets are a really quick and easy thing that you can order. Owl pellets, owls don't digest their food. They kind of um, regurgitate it and it comes out in a ball of fur. And within the fur are the, the bones and other things of the creatures that they ate. And so they actually sell um, owl pellets to science teachers and you just get the pot pellet and you pick through it and you see what's in there. You don't have to be a teacher to do that. You know, these are things that empower parents who can't even read, right? To be able to lead something that makes them feel smart, that makes them feel like I can teach my kids something or show my kids something. And you're finding little jaw bones and all these other, you know, neato things in it. We've had so much positive um, feedback and experience with just, you know, using owl pellets. Um, Jeopardy and games. So taking something like, you know, we have a game here called Wheel of Fortune and um, things like that. Taking games like that and just flipping it to be like environmental words. People love Jeopardy. People love the, the element of competition. I mean, you do have to be working with an audience of somebody who can read, right? Because it does involve that. And that is something that is a consideration in this work as well, because not everybody reads that we work with. Um, but I, I find that those kind of games are, are really fun. Um, people love tactile, like oversized things like dice. Like the food chain dice game is something where we use these, I think it's six by six by six by six boxes that you just kind of uh, take one to be your producer, your primary consumer, your secondary consumer, whatever, but you just kind of, you can roll those. I mean, again, just the tactile nature of being able to, and also using visuals and pictures to begin to help people understand the, the food cycle versus just talking at them and saying it, right? Another thing that people that has worked for us has been match. It's like something as simple as match. So we made a deck of 72, eight and a half by 11 cars. Now granted they're color and super high, you know, um, res so that people can actually see them. But we've got a deck of 72 species that live in Anacostia Park, which include plants, you know, mammals, reptiles, birds. And so one way you, we use them is just like if we go on a hike and just maybe pull them out. So I'm just using seven on this hike, but then we can also take 24 of them and have a matching set of 12 animals that upon matching it, you go, okay, what is that? And then somebody's going, oh, it's a bald eagle, bald eagles, da, 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 you know. But just again, it's the tactile, I think it's the visual, kind of developing for the non-reading user so that even the reading user can still, you know, find some value in it. Because I think people like fun. People like to laugh, right? People don't always feel like it's like, Arr! and we're definitely not a formal learning setting because we're outdoors, right? Anything could happen in the middle of one of our sessions. So that's another piece too, is just like the value of teachable moments. You know, it's nice to have a lesson plan and a curriculum, but what's your plan B, what's your plan C, what's your plan D, so that you don't lose the opportunity to keep the experience going. Something as simple as we, I mean, we do fishing, right? Um, we provide an opportunity for people to learn how to fish or just to even hold a fishing pole. 
We host hand dancing in our park, which is an old African-American culture. I mean, it's, I think it's out of Chicago, but it's a fun way that people like do this syncopated dance with their hands, but they love it. Um, we provide skating, which, um, you know, anytime you bring out a bike or something that people can ride or, you know, use, I think you're going to get a good, get a positive um, end result from people. Um, also, the use of live animals. People don't, I mean, at least the people I work with, sometimes these kids don't get a chance to model care. And I mean, you model care, you know, when you care for a plant. I mean, even that too works. But there's just some magic about bringing live animals into the mix. You know, I've done a lot of work with Rodney Stotts with bringing falcons and raptors and eagles. Like when you see, in my experience, in my 30 years, I think you get the same response, whether you're an older, wealthy person, a younger, doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity, where you're from, an a owl in your face, you're going to get, unless, you know, just not physically or mentally there, you're going to get the same, you know, so just the magic that comes from the spectrum of ways to, you know, whether you're using nature in the form of an animal or you're just sitting by a river to have a really important conversation, you know, that's something else we're working on is, is working with these mental health specialists to help parents who are coming home from incarceration have really difficult conversations with their families and just the difference it can make to happen in a natural setting versus again inside of a building or you know inside of a room. I think another undervalued thing that happens in parks are cookouts. Cookouts are therapeutic. You know when you have a cookout most people are happy. I mean in a good mood, there's food involved, there's, hey, remember this, there's game playing. But a lot of times it's a family member who maybe has been estranged that there was an effort to bring them together so that they can, re I mean, built re relationships are being rebuilt in those moments of positive experiences where they're meaningful and they're not stressed. You know, that, that makes all the difference in the world, how people are able to, to even show up to a conversation with a dad or mom that they haven't seen in 10 years, right? If I'm in a park setting and we're playing Uno or playing a board game together, it just kind of breaks the ice and allows us to be humans and feel that natural connection that comes when you're not stressed. And when you don't make an intentional effort to address that or give people a platform to have those experiences, there's, there's missed opportunities. So um, this is our DC Thrive Teen Respite Program. Let's thrive outside. And unfortunately today we have to be inside because of the inclement weather. Um, we're still pushing through. And so we've got the kids inside today. This is their chill station where there are today playing bingo for prizes. Um, coming in here, I'll talk a little bit more about the program. Okay, so this is our supply um, closet, as you see. Um, so the program is all about respite. Um, unlike most after-school programs, our goal is not to get them down here and shove information or teach them anything. It's really to create a safe space for 14 to 19-year-olds to be. That 14 to 19-year-old age is a is a group that, get, that misses out a lot because people focus on the younger kids. And they're the ones that need something to do. They're the ones that are getting in trouble and, you know, needing more constructive things to do with their time out of school. And so we built this program to, one, help them learn how Anacostia Park can be a safe space for them to, you know, come free. It's accessible to them. But but also helping build fellowship with other students and most importantly we want these kids to be safe during the after school time because you know the number one issue impacting kids right now is gun violence and we lose too many kids between 14 and 19 to gun violence and so our goal is that these kids survive this fall um, during the after school times with us down here we create this safe environment we've hired people from the community we've got folks um, that are not just you know cooking for the kids but also engaging with them watching over them and they have options so during the course of the day they also get paid to be here so this is their time card essentially they check in and they pick four activities four 30 minute activities that they want to do so they have to they can choose between one is mandatory they can't choose it's mandatory me time and that me time is a mental health station where they work with these two young ladies who help them deal with processing emotions coping um, a variety of things that they've identified in the pre service that they were interested in around mental health support. Um, another station that they have is a chill station where they could just take a nap because a lot of these kids are tired or they can play games like bingo, 
Um, there's a sweated out station where they can do things like basketball, ride bikes, skates, sometimes kayak, fish. Um, there's another station that's creative arts where they can you know, express themselves through creative projects. Um, and another station is homework help where we have someone here that helps kids that are working on homework or need some extra support. We're also going to build out the homework station to talk a little bit more about careers in our fourth week. Um, we're now in our third week and we're really excited. Our goal was 30 kids. We got 25. I'm not mad at that um, because we actually did have to turn some kids away because for us it was more so about quality over quantity. And so we're learning. This is our first time doing it. It is a pilot, but so far so good. Um, we love this. The kids are actually choosing to be here and we're able to show them you know, that we care by giving them some incentive and they get their service hours, which a lot of them are excited to do. So there's a variety of things happening here that, you know, behind the scenes that we're, we're doing to make this meaningful and not just another after school program. So the development of the Friends of Anacostia Park um, started to really take form in 2018. Um, 2019, we started having some of our first, you know, my first effort was to build this meaningful engagement cohort, which were those social service organizations and those environmental organizations who were already doing work around the Anacostia. So whether they were the Anacostia Watershed Society, who does an amazing job at cleaning the Anacostia River and doing tours and just educating people in general, to the Jobs Have Priorities, which is an organization that works with TANF recipients, um, to helping them with workforce development. So early on, we realized that, you know, one of the needs of the community was employment. And so we were thinking, you know, how do we loop people into the body of this work from an employment lens? And so what made the most sense was like a core, a core model. So in 2019, we started to build the Friends of Anacostia Park Friends Corps. Um, this was well before we had our nonprofit status, but needed the manpower to do these meaningful engagement events in the park, which were late skates, which is where we kept the skating pavilion open until 10 p.m., which it usually closes at dark, um, allowing people to skate longer and just more of a, 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 an intentional effort to engage families. You know, something we do at all of our events, which I think makes us successful, are these family portraits. You know, every event, I have a photographer there that can print, take a picture and print pictures of families together because a lot of these families don't have these family portraits. You know, we take those things for granted. Um, and again, sometimes these events is the first time they've seen a family member in a long time and it may, may be a while before they see them again. So these pictures become these really important pieces that I think people start to look for now when they come to our events. So the workforce development side of this work came by us, you know, being able to get some money from the conservation fund, which was really kind of outside of their lane, but they just really believed in the work and, and understood the importance of paying people. And so we were able to start training people up to help us at our events from helping us set up to leading games and activities to you know talking about the park history. So a lot of these things became skills that they were able to add to their resume that made them more employable. Then COVID happened. <laughs> and so um, while ironically, we were not working as much intentionally, the park started getting all this use because it was a space for people to come to, to be able to socially be socially distant and be outside and have clean air. And so there were some resources, some COVID resources we were able to take and be really creative with. And so by the fall of 2020, we started to build the next layer of the Friends of Anacostia Park um, core members who we brought into the park. And again, it's socially distanced, but we're able to have, be a presence to meet with, you know, to meet and greet and engage with this larger body of people who are now starting to be in parks at all hours of the day because people weren't in work, right? So you had people who were coming to the park morning, noon, and night. So by the spring of 2021, we were, we were able to build on the core model we had started, which was like an eight week training that previous fall to now where we, these folks, you know, had found their groove and we realized like, for example, Mr. Holmes, Fishing was his thing, so that became his lane. And Miss Phyllis, who was amazing at engage, you know, visitor engagement, that became her lane. And then they were able to train folks who were watching them. So by the time the summer of 2021 came, we started you know, to increase our engagement. I think people were feeling even better about being outside and around each other. I'm gonna ask, what, what, made, what drew you to this work? Like, what, what made you come into this work with us? Uh, I was going through my own things in life and your program was something for me to get outside every day to get to know myself a little better. What was attractive about my program though? Like what made you go, this is different, I'm going to try this? Because you've tried other things, right? But had you done something like this before? 
No, I had never done anything like this before. I was amazed at the kids from your program. They were doing nature. I was like, oh, wow, they understood trees, in which I didn't know. They taught me about birds. They taught me about flowers. I was just amazed at how the seven, eight-year-old kids knew these things, and I'm grown and didn't understand. So when you first started this program, so beyond just the learning of the trees and the grass, um, a lot of these kids were stressed. You knew their parents. Like you, you came in and you played a key role as like a community leader. Can you tell me more about like how you just transitioned into that role so effortlessly? Um, it was something that I like to do. I, I'm a people person, first of all. And the kids, when they was teaching me, I was teaching them. So to prevent them from doing something crazy, okay, Miss Phyllis out here, you know I'm going to go tell your mother. <laughs> so that's what I just, it, it just, every day came, it was a different thing every day. I can remember some experiences where we were having some behavioral challenges and you like knew the mother, the cousin, the aunt, the somebody, and not just knew them, but could pull out your cell phone and actually call them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's that kind of expertise that you can't really teach anybody, right? right? And so that was one of the first things that made you valuable to me because I knew that you had a connection to almost all of these kids and or their families. Um. Yes, in, in the neighborhood that I lived in, we were like a family. So we had to look out for one another's children. To, for me to help the neighbor upstairs child was a blessing to me. I, I needed the help just like the child needed the help. So if I could get them to come to your program or our program, our program it, was, it was a blessing for me. So I also know you mentioned that you were you were at a mess and you had your own things going on. Did this work help you with any of your personal struggles? Oh yes, oh yes, it really did. This, the environment itself helped me. Then to talk to women like you and several other women that that had it to, in my head, these women has it going on. I'm thinking I'm beneath these women, and these women pulled me up to say you're on the same level I'm on. They made me feel worthy again. Um, oh, wow. It made me feel excited within myself to be able to get out here and help the community and have fun doing it. It was something that I end up liking. I love it now. It's like these women took me hiking. They made me, I didn't even want to walk through the path. They used to make me, come on, girl, we're going through this path. It's just the walking, the biking, the camping outside. Who goes to camping outside? It was all of that. It, 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 it was just wonderful. That camping experience, though, impacted you. It did. You want to go again, don't I do. you? I do. <laughs> I really do want to go again. I really do. Um, yes, it was, it was so much fun. Yeah. Her phone. That damn phone. Is that your husband? No. No. Let me call you back. I'm doing an interview right quick. So if you don't mind me getting a little more personal, because there are a lot of people out here who are dealing with drugs, some functional, some non-functional, but how did this work help you with your sobriety? It did. Um, when I came into this, came into this type of work, I had already had about, I'm going to say 16, 17 years clean, more than that really. And the environment outside, me getting to meet other people that was less fortunate than me. And what I mean by less fortunate than me, because you know, in the drug world, when grandma died and, and, and big mama passed on, we have nobody to help us. With with our program, the the outdoors helped me itself. The, the entertainment outside helped me. So if they help me, I can help you. Um, I would like to start some type of program now for people to just have somewhere comfortable to go, somewhere where they, they, they feel at home. It's, it's not where people judging them. I want them to be able to just lay back mm -hmm. and enjoy. I know um, one, we have a problem um, not too far outside the park of a, of a little teeny park area that has a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot of drug use. And so Phyllis has the idea she wants to bring these folks over and bring uh, drug counselors into the park to offer some N.A. classes actually in Anacostia Park. Yes. Want to talk a little bit more about your idea? 
Well, it's a little part of the park, like she said, that we go past every now and then, and I see people, and I want to help. I want to be able to offer them um, a glass of cocoa, a nice coat if if we have it, and I want them to come and be comfortable and let them know that you can live and enjoy life without the use of drugs. You don't need a beer every day. You don't need a bag of dope every day to enjoy life. I have fun every day in Anacostia Park. Right. And so what do you think when you've been talking to these um, counselors because you've been putting this work together? Right. What do they think about doing this outdoors? Do they think it's a good idea? Do they, they think do. it's a crazy idea? No, I have a couple of friends that's on board. I just have to get the right. I have to do the step work for myself first because I need to get some type of documentation saying that I'm qualified to even do the work myself. Once I get that started, then I can start bringing other people aboard. So you would be a park-based drug counselor. Right. I don't know how many park-based drug counselors out there, but you might have your it, you baby. might have your future job out there. Start it, baby. Yes, yes, yes. But those are the kind of innovations that make this work meaningful because you can't not work with somebody because they they make you uncomfortable right. or because you're scared of them or whatever. Right. So the other thing about you is you will walk up to anybody and talk to them. Where do you get that? Have you always been like that? What makes you brave enough to talk to anybody? First of all, I've been in their shoes before, mm-hmm. so I. I it's how we talk to people. You know, when we walk up to an individual, you smile at them, you have something funny to say, they take to you better. If you walk up to an individual and you're nasty and your words not coming out right, they that's when the issue come in. Me personally, I'm a people person, I'm funny, I'm laughing at you, I'm always smiling, and I'm like, well, let's do this. So it's, it doesn't matter your color, whether you're using or you're not, whatever, I'm, I'm here for you. Anytime you engage in Anacostia Park, I try to speak to everybody that gets in this park if they come on this side or the other. So Phyllis was the one that spoke to this mom who was down here one day. We know that she was a little distraught, but she was actually down here with her daughter because the daughter's father had been killed a couple weeks before. And just how that woman was able to just naturally come to here by her on her own and for her daughter like to choose skating as a way of coping. What did you say to her? Like, How did you deal with her? How did you know she needed your help? Um, well, it... We all have a funny look about us when we're going through things, and everybody don't have somebody to talk to. Um, I learned a long time ago that people always say you talk to strangers, get things off your chest if you feel better. So in that particular case, I'm the stranger. So once she start blurting out to me, then I'm going to give her my experience, and then we're going to hug, and then she be like, oh, girl, I'm coming back. She be like, thank you, girl. I really appreciate it. And she has been back several times since that day. And I'm glad. That just let me know you did it, girl. Yep. You know. So my last question to you is, what difference do you think, because you've been in this park before the Friends of Anacostia Park was here, but now that we're a nonprofit organization, we're here, we've had almost our first year of like a full presence in the park, what difference do you think we make? Do we make a difference here? We do. What difference do we make here? We make a whole lot of difference in the park. Uh, we make sure that the skates are right, the bathrooms are right, we pick up the trash, we keep it clean out here, and we help our fellow park goers all the time. Even the park goers notice our presence in the park. They even commend us. They tell us, oh, y'all did a good job thank you all the time it's not just me the whole team it's about teamwork and 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 that's what we're here for thanks akima oh, please <laughs> last i'm the absolute last question do you think that we make people treat the park better because they see us here yes yes i do i do because some of them now we don't even have to tell them to put that in the trash some of them we don't have to give them trash oh miss first i got my bag girl or oh, dre i got my bag i'm all right so Yes, we, we do make a difference in the park. Yeah, and unfortunately, and fortunately, you know, our presence in the park, we got the bathrooms open. They were not going to open the bathrooms because they didn't have the maintenance capacity to, uh, to keep them up. So we, we started keeping them up, and I think we called them to task, and they ended up hiring a cleaning company. So now the bathrooms are open and clean. They were not going to be able to open the skating pavilion for another year because they closed down during COVID, but because we have uh, manpower, because that was the reason the Park Service couldn't open it, we were able to have them open up the skating pavilion, and, and thousands of people, I would say, yes. have been through skating since June yes. here in the park. So I just, you know, I hope you feel proud about this, because we could not do this without you. I am. I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm proud of myself, first of all. Then I'm proud of the work that I'm doing. You, Carl, and Lydia has brought me into this universe in the park, and I'm loving it. It, this 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 my gig. I ain't going nowhere. Work? Yeah, I ain't going nowhere. So you are a park visitor specialist. Yes. Say my name is Phyllis. My name is par- Phyllis. This, my name is Phyllis, and I'm a park visitor specialist. My name is Phyllis, and I'm a park 
Gore Specialist. My name is Phyllis and I'm a park visitor specialist. One, two, three. My name is Phyllis and I'm a park visitor specialist. Yes, you are, sis. Own it. Own it. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Phyllis. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. So we were able to get back into our swing of meaningful park engagement. Uh, we hired our executive director, this awesome guy, Richard Trent, who is from the Washington, D.C., well, lives in Washington, D.C., but had done a large body of work around fundraising, but specifically working in African-American communities as an African-American man. Um, so we brought him on board and then continued to build our core out. And we got our 501c3 status by the end of 2021. So when we started in 2022, we had, again, still had this buzz around our friends core that we were able to keep it building again. So we had another cohort building on the existing friends members who stuck around in the spring of 2022. And so fast forward now, we have a core of, I think almost 19 individuals who through AmeriCorps and through just general fundraising, we've been able to secure the, um, the dollars to keep on board from May to the end of October. I am Richard Trent, the executive director of Friends of Anacostia Park. Uh, before this, I was a nonprofit uh, executive fundraiser uh, for a, a lot of different organizations, some here in D.C., some um, in New York. Um, the I really, honestly, if I'm, I, I didn't see myself doing this, uh, just knowing who I was as a kid, which is like a pretty sheltered, afraid of bees, you know, didn't really go outside. So the idea of me being at the helm of a, of an environmental <laughs> nonprofit where I'm outdoors most of the time is, is pretty uh, bizarre to me. But I think it speaks to the transformative potential of this work um, of, of taking folks, especially black and brown folks who uh, don't always have uh, easy access to the outdoors and helping folks develop uh, a consistent and meaningful relationship with that uh, green space in their backyard or in, in their city, uh, it really actually does pull the best out of you and, and um, makes you realize things about your own personality that you you didn't you weren't clocking before. So I, I'm actually grateful for this job because it's it's illuminated some things in my own character and personality that I didn't even um, understand to be the case which is the power of, of, of outdoor exploration and nature, especially for, for stressed communities. You are here during Nature Fest, which is a week long celebration of families in the outdoors in Anacostia Park. It was started in 2015 in Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and is really just an opportunity for us to carve out some space for families to bond outdoors and to connect outdoors and to get to know this, uh, this green space and this resource um, in their backyard. Uh, so you'll see everything from fishing led by Mr. Holmes of our Friends Corps to uh, live animals walking around <laughs> that young people can engage with to outdoor art uh, expositions. And um, so it's, it's really, really exciting. And the idea is that this is a lot of stuff that would just typically be happening indoors. And we just want to bring it outdoors for families and, and kind of help folks, again, develop that connection to, uh, to this park. Um, it, it's certainly one of the bigger ideas, or connected to one of the bigger ideas at the heart of our mission, uh, which is really just being responsive to the needs of the community. Uh, so we, it's exciting, the exciting part of actually hiring folks from the community is that programming actually develops pretty organically and naturally just from the lived experiences of the folks that are on our staff, right? So we've got programming like our community fishing program that is a, a direct um, outgrowth of Mr. Holmes, his, his, his personal interest in fishing and angling on the Anacostia River. And now we offer uh, this fishing program to, to hundreds of, of youth and families every single year. Um, so it's one of the benefits of, of, of providing green jobs and meaningful employment um, to folks from the historically stressed and under-resourced communities is there's all, this, there's all this untapped expertise 
and wisdom that most folks are just sort of scratching the surface of. With programming like ours, where we're actually paying folks uh, a living wage to power this programming in the park, uh, you get a wide variety of innovative programming that is, again, uh, reflective of what the community is asking for. Um, one of the other big ideas that I think is central to Friends of Anacostia Park um, is this notion of leveraging the environmental uh, conservation effort to create opportunity for um, communities that have suffered from decades and decades of, of underinvestment and disinvestment. So I don't come to this work as, uh, as like a green thumb or an environmentalist or a conservationist necessarily. Before this, I was just uh, an executive fundraiser for, uh, for other nonprofits that weren't necessarily about outdoor exploration and things like that. Um, but I do see the, uh, the importance and the applicability uh, around job creation um, when it comes to, to Friends of Anacostia Park. That's something that's cross-cutting. It's, it's, not, it's not just something that friends groups should be preoccupied with. Um, it's actually, friends, friends of Anacostia Park is showing that when you make small tweaks in the way that you train your staff, in the way that you deputize and empower local residents to, to do meaningful work, you can actually create this scalable, replicable model um, that can exist in uh, an environmental organization or a youth serving organization um, or one that's focused specifically on parents. There's all these um, small ways that you can um, tweak your organizational model um, to, to empower residents and to, and to create jobs, which is especially crucial. Uh, maybe this is just because I'm in a wormhole around AI and future job destru destruction, but we need to start thinking creatively around what the what jobs are going to look like 10, 15, 30 years from now. And um, I'm willing to place a pretty big bet on the fact that um, many of the new jobs that are going to be created in the next decade are green jobs that look a lot like what the Friends Corps um, is currently doing, um, facilitating Nature Fest. Another central idea that I think is crucial to, to Friends Corps uh, and to the Friends of Anacostia Parks operation um, is this idea of of, of third spaces. Uh, there are not that many places, even in a vibrant, bustling city like DC, where s strangers can connect and, and, and actually develop meaningful relationships. Uh, with remote work proliferating, with, for, with folks more and more operating kind of in silos or in their homes, um, there is a real need uh, for common spaces where folks can connect casually um, because it's ultimately, I think, vital to the, the health and strength of our democracy. If you've got all these different uh, disparate communities that don't have any reason to come together or to bond over music or art or outdoor exploration, then I think you'd very quickly witness the disintegration of, a, of an ostensibly democratic society. So this is, a, this is um, it, it's, it's not just a, a job creation engine uh, here in, in Ward 8 in DC. It's also, I think, a pretty exciting experiment around um, what, what steps we can take to, to strengthen our democracy. So, you know, another piece of this too is innovating what is park work? You know, because traditionally people are in parks when it's warmer weather, but how do we take these core members now and have them attend meetings in the winter? Have them help us build out programming now that they've got all this experience and knowledge. None of these are, don't think any of them are co hold college degrees, but they are content experts in community. And that's what really matters to us. I mean, we can tag in these other experts as needed, but overall our framework is built on community um, expertise and you know meaningful ground truth engagement that attract and sustain you know relationships with stressed individuals in our so park. Another one of our core members that we were able to bring on for the 2022 season, um, I met this young lady one time in the park and I was just immediately sold. I could feel her passion. I could see that she was about her business and I felt her authenticity. Um, come to find we are pretty much from the same tribe. Um, LaShawn has had a very interesting story. I mean, she is, her resilience is just astounding. Uh, my name is LaShawn Johns. I'm 41 years old. Um, 
I uh, was just visiting the park, you know, being my normal self, and I was able to uh, be granted this opportunity to continue on and doing things that bring me joy, which is service to the people. Um, not only to the people, but mainly the youth, because I was once a troubled youth myself. Um, at the age of 16, I received juvenile life from the District of Columbia. Um, I was on the run for five years uh, at 21. I was an adult, and then I was able to reassert myself into society. Um, when doing so, it helped me realize that I need to give back and help someone else make a better decision than I did so that they will have a chance at success. Um, being down here working with the friends has been an amazing experience because I've had the opportunity to engage and learn um, from great teachers and great success stories to be able to continue on this journey. So Creating Safe Space is about establishing and maintaining relationships with inner city youth to help them uh, reshape their mindsets. And by doing so, we're focusing on education, mental health, uh, life skills, and just, you know, any tool that can be utilized so that, you know, we can all have a better future. So at the end of the day, you know, I want to thank Akima and Friends of Anacostia Park for this opportunity of serving with them this uh, past summer. And I look forward to coming back next summer in the summer after that. Sean just recently won a grant for her nonprofit. This is their first grant. Yes. And you want to tell, oh, tell us a little bit more about what you were doing. Because she, she was already using the park without us. She already saw the value of nature. Tell us about those um, roundtables you were hosting. Okay, so yes, we were actually awarded our first grant from the Builder Block Foundation and Gun Violence Prevention of the District of Columbia. Um, it was a $5,000 grant that allowed us to host our two programs. One was a uh, youth roundtable talk that we host right here in the park. Um, and with this roundtable talk, we were using arts and crafts for the kids to express themselves. Uh, we had a fitness trainer come out for some fitness training, therapeutic fitness. We also um, had mentors and mentees out here talking to the kids, um, trying to figure out, you know, how could we better assist them. Um, uh, with the the other project that we was hosting, that we are still hosting, actually we were just awarded uh, additional two weeks to uh, host the community clean project that we are going to host right here in Anacostia Park for the next two weeks, where we're able to give the kids a $25 stipend, and we're also able to give community service hours to the kids um, that require them in charter school, and then DC Public Schools require 100 hours to just complete school. So um, with that program, those two programs, and the award money um, we've been successful running these programs for the last four weeks but it will be a six week total at the completion of the project so let me ask you this talking to the younger Sean the Sean like so these kids that maybe are in a similar situation that you were in that you know are troubled haven't had very many positive models or just you know have trouble making good decisions like how do you see is, does it matter if you're in a park or not like how can parks make that difference in reaching those younger Sean's well, the park has brought me peace. So first I would say, you know, give it a try because, you know, we try the block um, and we see what the block has to offer. You try the park and you come down here and you get joy, peace, love, encouragement, uplifting, empowerment. Um, so, yeah, I would tell the younger Shans to, you know, give the good road a try. And what are your thoughts on nature? Like, do you believe nature can be a powerful tool for helping transform lives of youth? And how so? I believe nature can be used as meditation um, to connect to your inner self. Because um, the word is true. And he tells you green postures and still waters. And um, Anacostia Park gives you that, as you can see. So I would say that, yes, the park is a great place for serenity and a great place to find peace. Come on down. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sean. Same work, make the dream work. All the time. Let's get it. <laughs> you know, I think like, like most of us, we start with our parents. You know, they're the ones who bring us into this world. And I was lucky enough to have, you know, a mother and a father who were together at the time of my birth and some of my early upbringing. You know, they got divorced when I was seven. You know, I realized they were happier people apart, so it never really depressed me per se. But both of my parents had a, a love of nature. 
you know, they both had green thumbs. You know, my father was African-American from originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, very large family. They migrated to Saginaw, Michigan. But because they were from the South, they knew how to use the land. They had eth you know, land ethics. They valued nature. And so my father was a fisherman, a camper. You know, he ended up in the Navy which I think was a phenomenal opportunity for him where he was because he had very limited opportunities for really leaving poverty. Um, but the military, you know, he chose the Navy. And so, you know, he became uh, more world traveled. So by the time I was born, he was able to expose me to different things. So I had a very, I, my father was a key person in my life that I had a beautiful relationship and modeled, just modeled humanity for me. And I, I loved him to death. Um, one of the places that left the biggest impact on him was Japan. And so he had, and he loved to cook. And so he had all this Japanese, like uh, dolls and plates and pillows and chair, just all this stuff. And so we would eat on the floor and I was using chopsticks at the age of four, you know, and to this day, I, Asian cuisine is my favorite food ever. And so, you know, I just, you know, from that exposure, he would take me to, different cultural restaurants. I mean, a lot of them were Asian, like I was eating Korean food at five and loving it and, you know, Vietnamese food and all this. And so the food was one element. And he also took me fishing. And so I was able to watch him fish. I was able to see a fish. I was able to watch him clean the fish. I was able to then eat the fish. So I understood fish from a different perspective of the value of fish and sustenance fishing and, you know, you know, so I had a, a um, an appreciation for nature that one was appreciative of the beauty, but also just of the it provides for us. It provides food and shelter for us. Um, and so with camping, you know, he had a pretty diverse. So my mother was Caucasian, and so they had a, a very diverse network of friends. And so we would go camping as a village. And so I'm interacting with people from different countries. You know, so I had that exposure. You know, my mother had a, a gay male friend. So I was raised early on around marginalized communities. And so there was never, um, you know, the sense of division or racism that I experienced. Although again, I don't think I even realized my mother wasn't black until I was like in first grade. <laughs> you know, she was just my mother. She didn't have a color to me, right? But by us having those experiences and going camping, you know, I got to experience that village and have these positive experiences in nature embedded in who I was. So fast forward, you know, by the time I grew up and could make decisions or started spending time outdoors. So we, we started in a, you know, a neighborhood that wasn't as nice, but then, you know, by the time my parents were able to do better and afford better, we moved to kind of just one level up, which was this townhouse community that was a, not realizing that the dirt field behind my house or just even where my house was probably used to be a forest. <laughs> but because we had that um, exposure to that dirt field and we had these open, why our sewer drains were open, I don't know. But there were ways that we could walk through these storm drains. And we're just thinking it's water and it's cool. We didn't realize what was going through there because it didn't look like it. Um, we're just thinking it's access to water. But being able to play in the dirt fields, um, I can remember loving butterflies and caterpillars and, you know, capturing bugs in jars and not to be cruel, but just to witness them and just connect with them. Honeysuckles. I remember plucking honeysuckles and the fact that you could pull that out and honey was in this plant. And you're thinking in this flower and you're thinking, I've only seen it in a jar. Like, is it's not in a jar. Is this is where it comes from. I thought it was just incredible. I was blown away that I could have honey out of a flower that was out in the back, you know, that I had access to. So I, again, early on, nature blew my mind as this phenomenal source of power and just, again, provider. Um, I just, I had a positive, I had positive interactions with nature. And I think it had everything to do with, you know, my father being raised the way he was and my mother was raised on a farm. And so she too had a certain ethic of, you know, sustainable land use and sta sustainable land use development. And so those things, I think, made little Kima have the folder for it, right? But then teenager Kima, who started wearing lipstick and all these other crazy things and caring more about boys and stuff, um, you know, I got, I wouldn't say I was disconnected, but I think, you know, I just was going through that phase. But I can clearly recall, you know, once I had exposure to this career conservation development opportunity, you know, going outdoors, 
all that stuff came back to me, you know. And so it wasn't even about me not liking the experience of being in a desert. It was just the culture shock that came with that. And so that's why I think I was able to come back into this appreciation and really jump into the opportunity to become an environmental educator. So by the time I got to college, I had decided to study um, communications. You know, I grew up on, I, I loved radio and I wanted to go into radio and television production. And so I realized that my school, that came in the form of a degree in English with a focus on communications. And so, you know, I'm in my first year of college in my earth science class. And I think I was even goofing off at that point when this career conservation development program came and you know, we sign up for the summer experience, that SCA experience I mentioned. So when I applied for the Career Conservation Development Program, the fact that I was accepted was everything, right? Because it made me feel like, oh, I'm good at something. Somebody wants me, right? And then to come into this program and just the thoughtfulness that they put into, like our first convening was at Harper's Ferry. I had never experienced Harper's Ferry before. It's not too far from Washington, D.C., but I was blown away by Harper's Ferry and just the attention that they took to us and to see myself and all these other people who, like me, weren't thinking about careers in conservation. You know, I, I honestly was, I didn't think of myself as a green girl. <laughs> you know, I was, again, lip gloss. I can remember spinning gum out the, the van window when they had picked us up from the airport from one of our first convenings in that group. And the lady, uh, Marta, stopped me and she was like, hey, you know, why would you do that? And I was like, it's just gum. And she, she explained it to me and what if a bird thought it was a berry, that birds sometimes will confuse it for food and then eat it and choke and die. And I was like, oh no, was like I definitely didn't want to kill any birds. Like that was not my plan. I just wasn't conscious enough, right? And so the more they made me conscious of you know, what I was doing and its impact on other things and other people and just the planet, I started to go, oh, wait a minute, I do care about that. Like my goal wasn't to make the world a, you know, not a better place. Um, it's just, I didn't have, I wasn't conscious of that because I was just a teenager, you know, doing teenage things. So, you know, I think I unofficially started in environmental education in 1991 um, through the Student Conservation Association Marta Cruz Kelly and Destry Jarvis, who had the vision in 1991 to raise the fund and build a program, the Career Conservation Development Program, that focused on exposing careers in conservation to specifically women and people of color. Um, you know, that's still a need now, but for them to have that vision and for them to get all these agencies to agree to host, you know, um, women and people of color in these conservation and field careers, I think was huge. You know, I started at Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Um, I swore that I would never return because I hated bugs and it was just the desert and it was hot. And I didn't realize until I got back, you know, I had a whole different understanding of humidity, right? I had a whole different appreciation for trees and I didn't realize it, but at that point, I fell in love with that, that work. And so I actually went back again another summer you know, another another memorable piece to this was that the I was the only African American in the building per se, right? The uh, the only other African Americans at that park were on the maintenance team, and so you know that was a little disheartening for me when I really realized what was happening because there was a difference, right? These are people that are outdoors, sweating, picking up trash versus the people that are in these air conditioned offices on phones and I don't even know if we had computers in, but on computers, you know, and I was in that. So I almost felt like, you know, like I was in the house and they were in the field. And I, I obviously built relationships with those folks, but it called the attention to the lack of diversity in the career in those fields of interpretation and resource management um, and the National Park Service. And again, this was 1991. Um, so, you know, that that when I realized that I could bring something and be in that space and represent, I was attracted to that opportunity. Um, it wasn't about the plants and the trees. It was about wanting to kind of open that up. Um, and then just this woman, Kay Rohde, who was the um, chief of interpretation at that time, just the humanity she, she functioned with, like the fact that she offered me the opportunity to be a National Park Service interpretive ranger in 1993, without any background. I mean, I, granted, I had two summer experiences at that park, but there were these people who were competing for these positions nationally. And so there were some women who were very resentful 
of me having that position and they were not very nice to me. But, you know, thankfully, again, Kay was brave enough to say, hey, no, we're doing things different. Right. I came as different. And I, I thankfully I, it wasn't like they just hired me to hire me. I was able to bring some very helpful um, talents and skills to the table. They used to ask me all the time for feedback on their programs they were doing with urban youth from Las Vegas. Right. And I was noticing, too, how the same problems and challenges that were being experienced by these kids in Vegas paralleled the same challenges of these kids in these other urban communities because it you know it's the same community of parents who have to work two and three jobs you know who aren't at home or who aren't making enough to feed everybody so we got to figure out how to you know make this work or you know those stressed neighborhoods where there's drugs being sold outside so those neighborhoods aren't as safe you know so these were the same i know i saw the same kid in these inner city vegas kids as i did in these dc kids that i could relate to so that made me it gave me an, a community expertise, if you will, in how to approach and work with this audience of youth. Because it, it wasn't, you know, these kids lived not too far from Lake Mead, but they didn't care about the bighorn sheep. They didn't care about these other things. So when we were able to, I was able to help inform practices that helped them make connections to that. I think that made me valuable, which is probably why she saw fit and, and had the courage to say, listen, we're gonna, we're gonna hire an African-American interpretive ranger that we haven't had before in 1993, and you ladies gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> and they did, ultimately. So my time at Lake Mead National Recreation Area was in Boulder City, Nevada, which is maybe, you know, 20 minutes out of, 20 miles maybe out of um, Las Vegas. And so it was a very unique place because there's this huge lake, this dam by Hoover Dam, and I met all these people from different countries. There was just so many people from Germany, I don't know what the fascination was, but people from all over the world were coming to see Hoover Dam. And so I was able to have these interactions with them at the visitor center. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I was called to do some of the community engagement work, like going in my ranger uniform and going to these classrooms and talking about the park service. Um, and so within that experience, um, I was able to realize I was using those communication skills that I learned in college, right? It wasn't the traditional way I wanted, I thought I was gonna be on a radio, but I wasn't. Instead, I was able to use that as this interpretive ranger who was able to put voice, you know, to some of the things that, you know, wasn't traditionally focused on by the park service. Like, you know, um, we were doing, we were removing invasive species. And I was talking about how invasive species are like bullies. And these kids could immediately resonate with the idea of a bully, right? Somebody who, you know, mistreated them. Well, we talking about these invasive species and how they grow to choke out these others and outcompete, you know. So making those kind of connections at that time was, uh, I think, very valuable for the Park Service. So much so that they um, brought me back as a, a contractor. You know, they hired me, an independent contractor. So I got to work for myself early on um, to come in and actually help build curriculum. And so I had never built curriculum before, but I could inform it. And I, once I learned the framework, that's where I was able to start kind of thinking more like an environmental educator with lesson plans and, you know, building up the work that I was doing so that it could be replicable. So by the time I graduated college, 2005, when I was finished with college and the Student Conservation Association um, brought me on board to actually lead the program I was a part of. So I started to run the career conservation development program so we could build out and even more folks came through, like women and people of color came through and were able to have these experiences, not just with the National Park Service, but with the Forest Service, fisheries, you know, all of these different federal agencies that were focused on land conservation, where there traditionally were not people of color and or a lot of women um, in those, those places. And so, so I got the opportunity in 1996 to work with the Nature Conservancy to run their Capital Conservation Corps. And so this was interesting because when I went in for the job interview, the, the, the premise of that program was taking students from some of the stressed high schools and taking them into national parks in, D, in the Washington DC area to do uh, resource management work, like pit, pulling out invasive species, doing trail work, you know, picking up litter. And so in my job interview, I was like, no kid is gonna wanna do that. Like that's another form of slavery. Like why am I, you know, it's seen as a, like uh, I'm in trouble that I have to go out and do this kind of work. I said, what if, because I had the park service experience at that point, you know, what if we worked with the interpretive rangers 
and the resource management rangers. And a portion of the experience was just educating them about the park and, you know, learning the park's history, not just putting them in the park cold. And I knew at that point that resource management rangers weren't the most personable I had experience with. And I just knew that the kid, they probably weren't going to be kid people. Um, and so I said all this in my job interview and I thought it was going really well. And then like later that week, I got this uh, letter. It was very generic, but it said I did not get the job and my heart was broken, right? And so one day I'm just, cause I had friends at the Nature Conservancy. I'm over there to visit one of my friends and the guy that was hiring just happened to bump into me and said, hey, how long are you gonna make us wait? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, we offered you the job. I said, no, you didn't. I got a you know, letter saying that I didn't get the job. He was like, oh no, we want you. And so they hired me to run the, the conservation career, the Capital Conservation Corps, which was amazing. Um, it started in two schools. And then because of that work, the, the funders wanted to fund it again and grow it to four groups, to four schools. But the Nature Conservancy said, eh, we're done with this. We're not, we're not into people, we're into land conservation. It was a nice try, but we're gonna go back to land conservation. And thankfully the funders were like, Akima, what can you do with this? And so I went back to the Student Conservation Association, took the money and the program and added that to that career conservation development world of, you know, innovative, you know, exposing women and people of color to careers in conservation, but it was more so at the high school level. So once I took that there and built that up, it was just like, that's when I knew, like this was, this was my field. Like I get it. I see the, the magic that happens through these, this intentional exposure. I started getting these little gigs around DC, like the Anacostia Watershed Society hired me to develop their first river tour that they still use to this day. And I don't, I don't really flex when people tell them that, but that's huge for me because I have so much respect for the Anacostia Watershed Society and the Anacostia River. Um, and but, you know, when I had to do that gig, I had to read all this information about the park and about the river. And so that you know, made me an even better educator because now I knew all this backstory, right? And um, so that, that, that was my, another formidable gig that really kind of, to me, I, I felt proud of, right? That I had done something that could live beyond me. Because you know, I don't want to have to do everything all the time. I want to be able to create things that can live outside of me. And then um, I worked with the Earth Conservation Corps, where I got a chance to work directly with adjudicated youth, which I realized was really my jam, because these were kids who just were raw and had nothing to lose and were just incredibly honest. Um, and so, you know, one of my first gigs was to teach them environmental education. And this guy, one of the one of the core members, was like, "Mr. Came, I don't mean no disrespect, but I don't care about this. How does this help me stay alive? How does this help me feed my mother?" And I was like, you know what? That's a very valid point, right? Um, and so I started to try to think, how could I creatively talk about life cycles and parallel it to what mattered to them enough that you know we could find a medium where they were engaged and it wasn't just me talking at them or me putting my values on them. And so you know, another part of that involved bringing in live animals, going outside. You know, you know, environmental education in one world is just like. You, know, you say it and it means something and people get excited, but you can say environmental education in another world and they're like, what is that, right? And so that, that called me to the mat where I had to really look at the definition of environment. You know, environment in one world, like, you know, Akima's an advocate of her environment. You get this pristine idea of environment and trees and grass. But if I said Akima's a product of her environment, you kind of get that social element of environment. And so environment, when I looked it up, it said the living and non-living things that make up your immediate surroundings. And so I couldn't wait to take that back to the environmental education community and go, hey guys, we need to open up what we're talking about. Like crime is an environmental issue. Crack is an environmental issue. And it was incredibly relevant to the communities we were trying to work with. But the traditional environmental education community was like, oh no, 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 no. What are you talking about? We can't talk about that kind of stuff. And so I was conflicted early on because you know I also got realized I was being hired because I was African-American to work with African-American communities as a liaison. And that, for me, made it to where they didn't want to necessarily do the work. They just felt like, oh, Kima, you'll be our black representative. And I was just kind of like, OK, wait a minute. You know, at first I got into it because I was able to be creative and do all this. And they bring the funders out to see the work I was doing. But then when it came time for my my employee reviews, I got low marks. 
because I didn't write the report the way they wanted it. But I was bringing them all this money to work with, you know, African American communities. And so my, com my, my sense of conflict with being an environmental educator grew to where I was like, wait a minute, am I being used? You know, where's the equality for me as the educator, let alone, you know, the equality in um, the content and just how we show up for these communities that we want to educate, right? I was working with this fifth grade class at Ketchum Elementary School in Washington, D.C., and this little boy was very active that day. And he was, you know, just having a, a lot of challenges, behavioral challenges. And so I go to the teacher and I say, hey, you know, what's up with this guy? And she said, oh, you know, he's having trouble at home. He saw his mother get her arm broken by her boyfriend on his, you know, on the way out to, to school that day. And I'm like, whoa. And she just said it very matter of factly, like, and I'm thinking to myself, how can I expect this little boy to listen to me talk about fish when he's got all these other things on his mind, right? And why are we in a classroom talking about fish? Why are we down at the river? Why don't we have live fish, you know? So that was another key time in my life where I realized we can't take the same approach to this work, that we have to do things differently, that we have to, we have to approach this from a lens of humanity. And, you know, if that was, I mean, any kid, how do you, how do you go, how do you, how do you do that? How do you overlook the need in these kids' eyes and just fast forward to like, planet, save the planet, save the kids. You know what I mean? So I just early on um, grew a, a very strong sensitivity to those type of issues that made me probably uh, make a lot of environmental, traditional environmental educators uncomfortable. And so, you know, I continue to move throughout the field Thankfully, because of the opportunities I had to be a self-employed person, I was able to go out as a contractor early on. Another really key job, though, I went to a group called the Discovery Creek Children's Museum, which was phenomenal. But it was also, again, this was where I started my work in Kenilworth, where I was hired to help broker a relationship between the Park Service and the Discovery Creek Children's Museum because they wanted to come in and turn one of the classrooms at the park into an actual classroom because it was being underused. And so I went in and developed that relationship, but a part of that involved creating this year round programming with these kids. And it was amazing that we were able to have that many touch points because that's what those kids needed was that re those repeat experiences. They're so used to people coming and going out of their lives. To have someone in their life for a year was everything to them. And I still work with some of those kids to this day. Um, because of the connections we were able to make when they were children and just being an adult that they could trust, you know, an adult that, that treated them with kindness and warm regard, you know. And so fast forward, I get this call. So I was invited to this event in 2006 and it was the Conservation Fund was, this was when everybody was talking, like Richard Louv's book had come out or yeah, Richard Louv was a part of this conversation but it was an effort to get every kid in nature, or leave, no, leave no child inside. And so I went to this big meeting and it was like Disney and Dow Chemical Company, like all these big wig people, Sesame stores, Sesame workshops, like all these people talking about how to get kids outdoors. And there were not a lot of brown people in the room. And so I was able to speak at that and give some perspective. And I thought again, like these people were like, whatever, get out of here. The next day I get a call from Drew Becker who was the executive director of the New York Restoration Project in New York City. I had never heard of the organization before. So he calls me up and he, you know, he offers me this position as chief of education and programs. And this was like an executive position and more money than I had made at that point in my life. And I was kind of like, ooh, that sounds interesting, but I had just got to this place with these communities in DC that I didn't want to leave because I was just in the middle of like really doing some work um, around the Anacostia and, you know, just, just, I felt like I just found a groove with some of these families. And then he brings up Bette Midler and he's like, well, cause I said no. And then he's like, okay, well, have you heard of Bette Midler before? And I'm like, sure, like she's awesome. But again, is she gonna like, this job gonna change my life? No, she's gonna be rich. I'm not gonna be bad. Like, but I like Bette Midler, but how is she gonna change my life? And so I still said no. And then they invited me up and they walked me through their spaces and I got a chance to actually talk to Bet. And I was just kind of like, it, it occurred to me, I said, okay, New York has way more resources <laughs> for this work. 
I'd have the opportunity. One of the things that we're doing, they were building a garden with 50 Cent at that time. And I didn't really like him as a rapper, so that wasn't the selling point. But when I thought about, though, the executive nature of this role, I was like, maybe, you know, I could take this job for just a year and see if I can get more tools in my book bag that I can then bring back to DC and bring up this work. So I, I decided to take this job just, you know, I didn't think it was gonna, I wasn't gonna be there long because I was just like, ah, it's not really me. And I get up there and I fall in love with the city. Oh my God, New York City is amazing. The parks, the people, the diversity, the history, the smells, like all of this, just, I was infatuated. And the job, you know, being a chief of education and programs, I was able to hire people and I had a legit budget. You know, they gave me all this power that I was incredibly grateful for. And the reason they did this was because they had this body of gardens that they were investing, like each garden was anywhere from three to $500,000 to revamp, but they weren't community informed. And so they had these prestigious gardens that were being unused by the neighbors that lived right outside of them. And so they brought me in because at that point I kind of established myself as this you know, specialist who could program green spaces and parks with stressed individuals. And so I was able to come in and really help make some big changes, not just with the gardens that had been built to that point, but also kind of how we built gardens moving forward. And I was able to build a team of 12 environmental educators, the majority of which were African-American or Latina and who spoke Spanish. And in New York City, that was huge. I couldn't do it without that, right? And so just for me as an environmental educator to look and see that I was able to grow 12 diverse environmental educators was huge. One of the girls hadn't even considered herself an environmental educator, but she loved science. And th th those were teachable things, but what she had that wasn't teachable was she grew up in the projects in Harlem that she had all this experience with working on the front line of stressed communities. And so that was the reason she was hired. Um, the other stuff was totally teachable. And so she, in, to this day, you know, she's a science, she's a science teacher because of her experience at NYRP, you know, and she's so good with kids and just with everything. The New York Restoration Project experience, you know, I was helpful for me on so many levels. We had done these gardens with Target and Target came to us and was like, hey, we want to keep investing, but we want, don't want to do any more gardens. We want to give this to education. You know, what would you do with the money? And I was like, I'd hire more people. And they were like, no, no, no what could you create? Like, could you create a um, programming or something? And I was like, hmm. And I'd already been toying around this idea because most people think of nature as being like in the park. And they, they, they were overlooking the fact that the cockroaches in your apartment are nature, right? And so I just wanted to find and figure out a fun way to, to, to help people investigate their own habitats, if you will, in an urban setting and compare it or at least parallel it with like the same nature that you see in these parks. And so that came what's good in my hood. Um, you know, I had just lost my mother. My mother had just died. And I was, you know, thinking about the idea in my mind, but I took a break and I went to the Virgin Islands and I sat there and for like a week, I just downloaded all these ideas I had. And the, the other thing was with what's good in my hood was there were so many subject matters I wanted to cover. Like I didn't even talk about soil. I didn't even talk about energy like I wanted to. So I had to zoom it in too, because it couldn't be too big of a book, right? And so I came up with the, um, the chapters of what's good in my hood, because, you know, it was centered around the first thing of like, what does urban even mean, right? Because these kids grew up urban. They, don't, they know that there, there's a difference between like rural, suburban and urban, but they didn't know what it was called. They knew that there was water, but they didn't understand the water cycle. They knew they flushed the toilet, but didn't know where it went and turned on a sink, but didn't know where it was coming from. They knew there was a river there, but there was nothing connecting it all together. And the idea of the connection and the purpose of the connection was so they, they could feel the oneness, that you're not just over here, like you count your nature too, right? And rats are nature, <laughs> you know? So the piloting phase, it was a, a curriculum, but it was a body of lesson plans that we ground truth with um, a school right outside of Swindler Cove in upper Manhattan, um, New York City. And so in doing that, we were able to test out like what, what worked and what didn't work. And it involved, you know, not just a community investigation, but we also did park investigations. So we could begin to draw like, how do we put, how do we draw the parallels between like a, an ecosystem on Dykeman Street and an ecosystem in the forest by the river? It took a year 
to pilot it. Um, we got the feedback from the teachers. We got feedback from students. There was also a homework element. So parents were able to be a part of it and gave us feedback. And then we have to also think about how, if people were using this book outside of New York City. It is urban specific, so you do have to be in an urban area, but it didn't just have to necessarily be New York City. And so it started smaller. By the time we finished, I think it's 54 pages long, two-sided color. You know, even, even everything from just the paper that we printed it on, you know, had to be water resistant. It needed to be a firm spiral bound because we wanted kids to be able to flip it and use it when they took it outdoors. And so it was a very intentional process. I could shout out so many people. Uh, Shelby Gaulaird was incredibly helpful in the development of that book because she's a curriculum specialist. And I was not a curriculum specialist at that time. I was a content specialist, but she helped build that framework of how to make this usable in the classroom, in the home space, in the workspace. I've had so many people um, stop me and just tell me how they've been able to find use in this book. And we had people um, interpret it into French. We had people interpret it into Spanish. They didn't reformat it, but they at least were able to make the language um, understandable and accessible to, to people outside of the, the English language. Um, I'm, I'm still considering ways to um, you know, take that book to another level to where it actually can be formatted and digital so that kids can share because so the part of the premise of the book is there's these five experiences where you go out into your neighborhood and you collect data and so like the first one is like where do you live and so you're documenting you know everything that you like 20 things that you see on your walk gum wrapper pigeon trash uh a sign you know all these different things and then you come back and you go is this living or not living was i surprised to see it not surprised to see it what does it do so we have a you know, conversation about that in the first um, unit. And then the second unit, we're taking those things that are living and we're saying, OK, if it's living, it, what, what do you need to live? You know, food, water and shelter. So that rat is finding food, water and shelter. That pigeon is finding food, water and shelter. All these th that human that you wrote that you saw, food, water, shelter. Then you come back and say, OK, the second unit is called Can I Live? OK, where are these things? Where are they getting their food, water and shelter? So they go back and once I remember when we were piloting this, they were looking for the water source for the pigeon. They'd already figured out the food, they'd already figured out the shelter, but they couldn't figure out where the pigeons were getting their water. And thankfully it had just rained. And so there was a puddle and this kid was, he was like, this is where they're getting their water. And this kid wants to go and splash. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is where the pigeons are getting their water. You know, like they had never thought about that. You know, they had to follow the pigeon to see where they were living, which was under the train bridge. And so the kids really got into this. And that's when we realized like, hey, maybe we're onto something. Cause they were, you know, they hadn't considered their community as important before, right? Cause they're told that they live in the hood and it's da 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 and it's bad, bad, bad. Whereas you got all these phenomenal factors going on in your neighborhood that sustain life outside of humans, right? Let alone the humans. Um, the third chapter goes into food. So, we, so then we go a little deeper on food and um, water. So the food element was really fun because we walked along their neighborhood and found all of their food sources. And from that, they were able to realize that some of them didn't have grocery stores, like that they were getting everything. They were getting socks, T-shirts, bread, milk, all this from one store, a bodega. A portion of that workbook also included something called data sheet, a data sheet download where they would take and like, I think for the food one, we asked them to color in these blocks. So by the time they finished it, they had a graph that showed where the majority of their food in their neighborhood came from. And for one specific neighborhood, we realized that they didn't have a gro access to a grocery store. Another one, it was the bodega was everything. And so the next level to that was, okay, if that's your food source, let's go in and let's see what kind of food they have available and where it comes from. And I remember this young man um, was at the lunch counter, the lunch meat counter, and he had asked the guy where the meat comes from. And the guy was like, I don't know, it comes in a truck every Tuesday. And the little boy was like, you can't tell me where the meat comes from? And he was like, I don't know. And the boy was like, I wanna know where the meat comes from, you know? So again, flickering the curiosity in these kids to even care, because how many people think about where their food comes from, you know? So it's just another level of awareness and empowerment for the users of what's good in my hood to not only feel good about their neighborhoods, but feel empowered about the choices they have and, and make noise, which is the, so this water was the fourth unit, but the fifth unit was called Don't Shout, Speak Out. So the other piece was to find something that you're not happy about in your neighborhood. And the, it says that, you know, as long as you're well-informed, 
and you are respectful, you have the right to make noise about something that you want changed. And so you put in your zip code at this thing called congress.org and it tells you who all of your leaders are from your basic council members all the way up to the president. And so on that sheet specifically, you know, they transcribe the phone numbers of these people. And so when they found out that they had the phone number at this time, Barack Obama was the president. At that time, they had the phone number for the president. They were like, because they didn't realize that all these people were in power to represent them to take their concerns to the president. Right. And so obviously this was not a direct line to President Obama, but the, the awareness that came for the kids and the sense of empowerment that, oh, this is why people vote. Oh, I do count. Right. And so, you know, these were, again, third through fifth graders. So they weren't necessarily bringing super big issues to the table. But, you know, like one of the things that I remember one of the girls saying was a problem in her neighborhood was uh, were homeless people. Because in that fifth unit, we go out and we kind of document issues in the neighborhood. And uh, one of the outcomes of that was that they would make some sort of advocacy art. And so she made this poster about talking to older folks so they wouldn't drink because she made the connection that this person was drinking because they were sad. And it, it was so deep. And I just remember that was just so jarring for me because the, I remember the guy she was talking about because on Dykeman Street there was this, thankfully he was a happy drunk, but he was clearly, you know, it was probably scary for a kid to see somebody like that, but they walk past that every day. But for her to pick that issue in her neighborhood is what's not good. And then what could be done about it, that her what could be done about it was just spending time with older folks was just, you know, from the mind of a kid, like just the humanity in that. Right. So I just I learned I grew a lot from the development of that book, but I'm also incredibly humbled by the reviews and just the fact that people find it so useful. I I really one day want to do a follow up book to that book. What is the role of uh, community and organization partners in advancing your current work? Oh, it's key. It's pivot. I can't do it without that. That's what the nature, the, the nature of this work is the innovation that comes out of people meeting people. You know, both folks focused on probably one outcome, which would be health, but maybe it's mental health and physical health. But, you know, I do boat trips. I counsel people. What does it look like for me to counsel people on your boat? What does it look like me to, to vote around people counseling? Like there's so many potential opportunities if you see it in that type of work. And so um, I, at the beginning, had created this tool that helped me kind of map that out as I talked to other groups. Because another layer of this is that I'm really kind of weaving in community-based groups and environmental. So if you think about a circle and you've got this line down the center uh, cross, and on the top are like your community partners and the bottom are your environmental partners. And so both with the first circle is that trusted. So who are these trusted partners that I know I can go to last minute sometimes? I don't want to do that, but you know, just those trusted partners that look out for you and but just at that level of trust, like I got you, you got me. There's then the next one of courting where sometimes, you know, people are working on those relationships that, you know, it takes time. Everybody's not there yet. And then the next one is sort of like transactional. So just being honest about some groups just show up for each other in a transactional nature of like, take a picture, thank you, bye, whatever. It's not really, there's no depth to it. There's nothing wrong with it, but I don't find a lot of meaningful work in that zone because it's really kind of sometimes actually helps people stay disconnected because people don't really dig deep or look behind their curtain. And that's why they go five years still talking about diversity and inclusion and never really fix it or address it because they keep box checking um, and stay in that transactional zone. And then there's also associates. And associates are those people, which I get a lot of, that I really don't like, that will use my name like, oh, we did this and da 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 dude, I don't know you. We are technically could be associates. I might remember you. Maybe we nodded at a, pl a club once or the, a workshop or I don't, I don't know. And I have definitely met people before. But if you don't do the work of relationship building, you don't deserve to call that trust. And you haven't really earned it. So at the same time, you're an associate. Like, let's keep it real about what lane you're in. We are associates. We're not partners. We're associates. So that's that network kind of calling out relationships for what they really are. Not to be rude, but to be accurate so we can stop playing these games around doing this work. You're either working with the right people or you're not. You're either respectful enough to maintain relationships or you're not. And if you don't have those relationships with those partners or those people, 
that's on you. Do the work. <laughs> that's why that's why I made the tool to be honest with you, but I ain't gonna say nothing. <laughs> Can you name some of the current most trusted partner organizations? Uh, and how do you remind them about your shared me meaning of your work? I would say one is probably jobs have priority. Um, because we work with um, this woman, Carol um, Gilmore, who is, uh, manages their workforce development program. And she has been super key in helping us nail these human development factors that go into workforce development to help us really provide full circle support to our core. Because these are a lot, you know, second chance folks who come with trauma and triggers and disempowered thinking and fixed thinking and but also come with all these talents you know and sometimes you can't unearth those talents if you don't think about those other things and she's been a really key partner in helping us not only identify but creating the resources and then pull the best out of them is your work more about engaging communities or creating communities i there's a quote i love alex i gotta put this out there it says the person who loves their idea of community will destroy community while those that love those around them will build community. And this was by Dietrich Baumheiser. And I love that quote because I was at the beginning, I had all these ideas, but I wasn't loving the people around me. And then once I looked at that, I heard that quote, it impacted like, in that, that whole process is about building community. Like you have to build the community to then engage them. So many people engage on a transactional level of just like, I'm engaging you because I want you to do something for me versus I'm engaging with you, you to learn more about you, to find out what you need, to find out how you use this, you know what I mean? So I would say my work is uh, really more about creating community. How does meaningful park engagement impact systemic problems that influence this community? Because the model includes this workforce element, so we are thinking about community economics, but then the other side is where we're working with existing agencies. Like my, my focus is on being, helping fill the gaps of these existing agencies. So for DC, our city agencies, our mayor's offices. So how are we helping with the Office of Victim Services? How are we helping with behavior health, mental health? As we come in through those smaller ways, I want to get on the mayor's radar as something that is important that's helping her get her work done. It's a new way that people are addressing these bigger needs around community engagement. Um, they're seeing that they see parks as allies. They see parks as these resource spaces. I think that then gives us the platform to stand on and go, hey, make us a, make parks a priority in your budget because this needs to happen. Um, on a national level, I mean, we are on a federal property. So I think there's some ways, I mean, I can't predict the park service in the Department of Interior. I can definitely uh, make the need known. We can definitely increase the number of people making noise about it. But what actually happens, I would hope that they would respond because supposedly this is the people's park, right? And these are the people. They're just not used to these people knowing how to articulately advocate for what they want and need in the park. And so that's what we're doing is helping on that level too, so that it can be the people. It has to be the people. It can't be us. It has to be the people. And so helping people wake up mentally, physically wake up to where they have agency in their lives and dig a little deeper and make some noise about the things that are relevant to them. I mean, we still partner with this group called the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative, and they have a network of people that are connected to folks that do policy, which is really important and needed by some of these folks, because some of these people care about policy as it relates to um, one, of our, one of our core members wants to advocate for something around parent rights. And so, you know, some of these policies may not directly match the park, but could be a great convening point for people that feel that way. So I think we're kind of like a little underground railroad, if you will, to the way that a lot of these things can maybe bubble up through maybe a healthier human population that can advocate better for themselves and hold these systems accountable. What are the current priorities for Friends of Anacostia Park? The current priorities are to um, continue to build and sustain this uh, meaningful workforce development model that um, hires from the community, that puts people in purpose positions where they're able to show up and help us lead truly community-informed programming. Um, another side of this would continue to build out our grounds and our promise and commitment to infrastructure um, enhancement in this park. Uh, there's a lot of projects that need some love, and I think we've got to just 
we're thinking smart about how to do this, not just us, but the partners that make sense and the park service and all of the opportunities and resources that actually are out there. Another priority would be probably around solidifying our programming. You know, we're going into our third or fourth year of late state, our hundred and eighth, fifth year of park, being a park. Um, programming wise people know us and they're starting to appreciate what we do in and outside the park so we want to be able to show up by fall with a, a menu like a callable menu that people can look at and really know what we do and ultimately next year would love to end up having field trip programs happen here like actual environmental education led by core members happening as a field trip destination another priority of friends this year is the work around respite and responding to mental and physical health needs of the community. Um, we are specifically partnering around victim services and reentry services, but around victim services of helping folks come to the park and, and heal. So for example, we wanna do this thing called grief guides, where we have core members who are strictly focused on receiving people who are in waiting. Like there's a two month wait for therapists, for people who are in the thick of experiencing crimes and traumas, we wanna be able to show up as a space that they can come and not that we're gonna administer any kind of counseling, but just having people be able to show up in the park space and use it for respite, to sit and be quiet, to sit in a nice chair, take a nap, or to take a walk and actually talk to someone. You know, another part of this is maybe matching those people with people who have experienced those traumas, like having the park be a place for mothers who have experienced gun violence and loss of their, their, their loved ones to be able to come down and just be an ear for others. So I'm just trying to open that up a little bit and see if we can formulate some sort of model that engages those people in helping us uh, support those audiences of people in, in need of respite. So do you think that students in your programs here in DC would require also a far away experience in nature to get really interested in you know all kinds of nature and become environmentalists in the long term? One, I don't want to sell the idea that nature is far away. Um, but I also think that experiencing different biomes because if you're in the urban area all your life, you don't understand what a tundra is or what grasslands are, or just how vast this planet really is. And I think just getting out of your environment anyway for anybody uh, is, is helpful because it gives you perspective. So we recognize the importance of you know, these kids getting out of their environment and experiencing new environments. I mean, it, some people are afraid of airplanes because you got to think about also the route to get to these places. So they don't necessarily have to go to the other coast just yet. But like for us, we're taking them to the Eastern shore um, in our programs because it's not too far of a ride away. Um, there's also a tremendous history piece to the Eastern Shore. So you go out Route 50, you go over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. The Chesapeake Bay is huge, right? And it's got seven states in its watershed. Um, but so what we do is we take these kids out to the uh, Blackwater Wildlife Refuge. One, getting kids to understand the park systems like that there are federal parks, that there are state parks, that there are city parks. And then when they understand like the national, like that the national park is land that's federally protected, like it blows their mind. Cause most people think parks are just like, oh, just a park with a pinch and a playground. They don't even understand the multitude of effort that this country has gone through to secure these lands, to ensure them as spaces that they can go see. I mean, I would love to take kids to Yosemite and to some of these grander national parks one day in life. But I think for now, just starting with where they are, because there are people who turn down opportunities to go do that because they're scared because they've never left their neighborhood. So we're trying to address that by taking them on little incremental visits to places that are just a couple hours away. And I, I tell you from, from what I've experienced, when you go across that Bay Bridge, those kids are just like, oh, wow. And they want to go back again and again. And most of them love crabs. And so when we talk about this is the home where most of your crabs come from, they're just like, oh. you know, so it's making it relative, you know, connecting it. You know, we may we may have values around, you know, visit, visiting national parks and doing these things. But for somebody who's never left their neighborhood, that's a huge thing. So I would say incremental starts, but definitely exposure is, is everything. How does your program support students' individual identity, individual narratives? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, we do make space for um, mental health efforts which um, look at pulling out from them like their self-image, their self-esteem, 
Um, I think we also intentionally put people that look like them around them and we intentionally model positive interaction, warm regard. Um, I think it's a long journey to help kids with self-identity because there's so many other places that they see each other and the media is just, ugh, you know. Um, so what we do is we just try to model for them real people who are different, who are quirky, you know, who like things that maybe other people don't like, but have the courage to still like and be the only person that like it. You know, we, we're modeling courage. Um, we just, you know, try to intentionally uh, model the best version of ourselves around the kids. And I think that will, you know, inadvertently impact their self-identity. Because a, a lot of what they know of themselves as African-American youth is what they see on TV. So they're caught up in the rapper and the entertainer and the athlete and the whatever. And so they get to see everyday people who are actually happy people. Like we're, we actually like ourselves. Like I love myself, you know, I'm not the you know, ideal version of beauty for what America wants you to think, but I'm, I love myself, right? And so when these other girls see us modeling esteem, right? And not just one, so this is the other side of this work too, is we're with them for six weeks and we wanna see them beyond those six weeks. It's gotta be repetitive. It can't just be one time. If we see these kids over the course of a year and they keep seeing this, it, 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 I'm telling you, it, it comes in. They start to identify themselves through us, which is great because it's a diff different version of them that's not impacted by me trying to be rich or me trying to be a singer or me trying to be a model. They get to interact with and, and have modeling from genuine, authentic humans. What are some of the principles of providing trauma-informed work? Providing trauma-informed work first starts with me thinking about you as a human and what your history might be as to why you, you know, where you're at or how you may be feeling or something once I've maybe identified. Because sometimes you don't even realize people have gone through something, but most people have gone through something. So just kind of having that approach where um, I'm very intentional, one, about making sure you feel respected. You know, respected is a key principle in trauma-informed work. I'm um, also safety like making sure you feel safe, that you're in a safe environment, um, that you trust me, you know, trust is another principle. So I maybe do that work to where I get to know you or I, you know, know what you like, or I make the intention to potentially show up. Like I don't just come in here thinking I'm gonna do this work tomorrow, but like I really invest the time that it takes to do this, to build that trust. Um, giving you choice, like, you know, giving you the opportunity to make choices about this, that you don't feel like this is happening to you, but this is happening together, um, which another principle would be just sort of feeling empowered. Like you feel like this is something that you're a part of, that's happening with you. Um, and then ultimately that partnership, you know, the principle of partnership that we're doing this together. And I want people to feel like clients or like they're victims, that they're actually partners in this work that we're doing, because they are. You know, they help inform this, they help make this relevant, they make us important. And I love it. I noticed that you often use the word um, investors instead of volunteers in relation to participants of your programs. Why is that? Um, because I think that when you think about engaging people from poverty or people who are borderline poverty, and you make the assumption about how they're going to spend their time, like you think that they should spend their time coming to your park at 7 a.m. to remove trash, it's, it's unrealistic because you're also asking for people to invest time. Like how people decide to spend their time is a direct, you know, reflection of their values. And so there's an assumption that people want to get up and come pick up this trash. In a lot of communities, picking up trash is a form of punishment. And so most people look at, you know, getting up on seven, at seven o'clock in the rain to go pick up trash is punishment where somebody else who has a different ethic around that, can't wait to get up at seven o'clock and come pick up trash because they feel proud about that, right? Um, so I think the level of, of, of work that we ask for people unpaid is, I think for certain populations, again, impacted by poverty, it is an investment because we're asking them to do something for us, right? That they may not already wanna do because they don't have values around a clean neighborhood because they've never owned property so they don't really care, right? Or they've never, they walk past trash every day. So it's like, uh, I'm just gonna pick it up. It's gonna be back on the ground again, right? Um, so when I started framing this as investors, because again, when you think of an investor, you treat an investor way better than you do a volunteer. Cause volunteer is like free labor. 
investor is I'm giving you something. I'm, I'm, I'm investing in you, right? And I've noticed that it, it makes people, the actual investor, feel more proud that they have something to give. So another thing, you know, like um, people often ask with investors that it's money, like financial capital. We look at human capital. We value social capital. You know, so I'm asking you to give me something valuable that's not money. And so when these people can provide human capital or social capital and be valued just as much as if they wrote a $5,000 check, their chest goes out. There's more pride in what they do because they realize you're respecting their effort. Whereas again, with a volunteer, it's just, I think volunteer is just overused and has a lot of assumptions about people caring about what you care about and want to do that. They're not bad people because they don't want to come out and plant trees. I mean, there's another way you can frame that. Like in, when we were in New York City, we framed that steward, that stewarding those trees in the form of care. Like we named the trees in honor of somebody who died in their life and they wanted to make sure that tree stayed alive. Their whole effort at that, they invested in that through the memory of that person that died. Not because they believe in trees and want cleaner air. Granted, that's really important. But for the average person who's not, doesn't have that value, they could watch a tree die and not care. But when you put the name of a loved one on there, you get a whole different level of investment from the community. Um, so that's the other piece of this too, is um, when we approach people as investors, it's more so from an asset-based approach versus like a, oh, volunteer, come give me a couple hours kind of thing, you know? And being thoughtful about the type of things you ask people to do. Like we look at more than just picking up trash. Like some of our volunteer, our investment opportunities, we, for elders who can't move a lot, they're very helpful at a playground because they can sit there and keep an eye on things and make sure things are safe. They can read books to kids, right? They are investors. And especially when you look at elder populations, they feel really, really important when you bring them in and you show them that there's a need that they can actually meet that they're already equipped for. They don't have to learn how to do that. This is what they're naturally good at. You know, basically capitalizing on their community expertise. How do community members contribute to programming at uh, Friends of Anacostia Park? Well, we've got this unique program called the Community Residency, um, which is where they apply to get $1,000 to do five two-hour programs. And so the key thing is that those programs have to either address mental, physical, or social well-being in Ward 7 and 8 communities. And so if they're able to do that, they get the $1,000. We're essentially showing them that we value their time we're giving them $100 an hour for their time, essentially. Um, and we do provide some level of, of um, supply support. So we give them, uh, last year we did a little bit more, but this year they get about 100 bucks to go toward their supply. But honestly, you know, these are folks that come with really innovative ideas where they just want to come and engage folks. And so um, we had one woman come from, um, she created something called Busy Bipolar. She has uh, two bipolar children and so she works a lot around that mental health space. That's not even her day job. She's like a programmer. She's a highly intelligent, crazy intelligent woman um, who uh, had this idea for something called Rage in the Park, where you come into the park and you learn about anger management, but that it's okay to be angry, but there are ways that you can work it out. And so she brought these boxing instructors. And so they teach you anger like management through Rage in the Park, through just boxing. And she did some specific ones with kids that was really amazing where she got to explain to them like you know it's okay to have um anger like there are things that are going to upset you but at the end of the day you can do things by managing it um, we have arts and crafts for seniors they really enjoy that it's a form of respite we have uh, this emotional wellness seminar that we did uh, a few different ways included yoga some of them included sage workshops, um, learning more about how to use crystals and meditations and healing. Um, we do group drumming um, specifically for kids at our late skates. Um, we've done jewelry making. And so the other, the other key thing about this is like during our ideal times with, with late skates where we've got at least two, 300 people in the park, these folks pop up and provide programming for us essentially, and they don't have to worry about numbers. So we, you know, when you, when you do these community residencies, sometimes people have an idea that they can call in their own particular audience, but then there's other times where they just want to pop up where there's already people in the park. Cause it's a lot of work doing programs and getting people to actually come out to your program in the park versus being able to just try something out here. Now, one of our residencies involves this guy, Rolo, who's a famous local skater. He's amazing. He does, he and his team do family um, skating um, classes 
on Sundays. They'll be doing family skating classes. And so he doesn't need us because he's got a big enough name that he draws people around. So, you know, we've got a variety of different ways that community is helping us uh, in, I guess, invigorate our programming to where it's more really truly relevant and enjoyable to Ward 7 and 8 families. Do you think that there's anything missing in your work and you would like to add? I would say for me, I've been very focused, like laser focused on low income African American communities. There are also low income other communities. And so I would like to kind of expand my work to be more inclusive. I don't specifically not include, and I also live in a community that's primarily African American. But I, I've thought about that because I wouldn't want to alienate anybody. And then also other marginalized communities. Um, I know a lot of the youth that we work with, uh, specifically African American youth, are not um, very supported in their, you know, if you're not heterosexual, like everybody's trying to model and pretend that they're heterosexual because you're not supposed to be gay. Um, and we intentionally hire people who are different. And so I would love to add another dimension that specifically considers other forms of marginalized communities that can be included in this healing. Um, because I know they're out there. I just, you know, I would never want to alienate someone. I mean, if we're talking about self-identity, that's, there's layers to that. It's not just like what you think of the planet and what you think of yourself. There's a lot of other pieces to that. And so, that, and that's the other part of why we want to open this work up. Because as we get more mental health providers at the table, more counselors at the table, you know, we can open that up and have more people with more expertise and specialties that can help you know, uh, youth with those type of issues or those type of identity issues. Again, just having nature be the backdrop. It doesn't have to be about trees and grass and birds. It could just be a deep conversation that's able to be had under a tree on a sunny day in a park. I'd like to learn a little bit more about civic engagement. In addition to students writing letters or knowing the names and phone numbers of their representatives, are there any other civic activities that they might be involved in in your program? Yes, we actually do mock town meetings. I was just uh, talking with someone today. There's a piece of Anacostia Park at the bottom part where you came off the train that is uh, called Poplar Point. And that place has been, it's up on the block for, uh, that's gonna be transferred to developers. But uh, 70 acres of that has to stay natural and the Park Service gets to make the decision on how they do that. And it needs to be community informed. But this has been in the works for at least 20 years. And so a lot of people have lost their hope. Um, they feel like it's just gonna turn into condos. And so there's been a resurgence around getting more community input to hold the Park Service accountable to maintain those 70 acres as natural space. And so we're doing a mock town meeting with these teenagers to prepare them for, I mean, it's, it's mock now because they're learning what a town meeting is about and they're getting roles because they're not totally educated on the space. But for the future, as when we start having these meetings with the developers and the park service, that there's actually a youth presence there to, to advocate for what they want because they actually thought it out, learned it and know. Um, and, you know, the other side of this is when we talk about climate change and you're talking about uh, development on a floodplain, I mean, it's just so many opportunities for kids to really understand the impact of climate change and flooding because they're starting to see that now. So, I mean, we're, we're tagging we're tagging them in in teachable moments of how like even with the weather, when you talk about hurricanes, you know, there's so many ways to um, bring in advocacy and empower kids to make not just decisions as kids, but in the future, they're going to be voters. Right. We want them to be we want them to have an environmental folder by the time they become a vote, a voter so they can actually vote not from what they saw on TV, but from what they know from their heart, from what they got from experience. Akima, could you name two or three names of educators in the U.S. whose work resonates with you? Absolutely. Um, along this is this goes way back, though. This was um, in the early late middle 2010, 2011, somewhere in that zone. Um, there's a woman named Lori Truzzi who works out of North Carolina at a school for blind children. And um, just learning her personal story and what she overcame and just how she, like inclusion, most times people think inclusion and diversity, they're just thinking around race. And they don't even think about, you know, what it takes to, to describe and, and engage uh, someone without sight in certain themes for environmental education, right? And so just her, her authenticity and her true drive to work and connect with you know marginalized communities with kids that you know take a little extra work 
I was I fell in love with her early on and her body of work, which, you know, wasn't anything super fancy. It was just the the sincerity behind it and the impact that she had. You know, impact doesn't always have to have glitter and gold around it. Impact is when you can really reach somebody and not just reach them for that moment, but really shift something in them that's a long term, lifelong learning lesson, which I, I get from her. Uh, a second person, Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was an environmental educator, and I know she wasn't in my lifetime, and I didn't get to physically witness her work. But again, if you could imagine what it took for somebody, what she had to know to do what she did, to know where to walk, to know what to eat, to know what to not eat, to know how to read the sky and the stars. You know, when I first considered her as an environmental educator, I got inspired. And so the, I, I know she's a non-traditional environmental educator, and most people probably hadn't thought of her as one. but. I would, I would imagine she was a pretty awesome environmental educator to lead people through nature under the terms that she did. What would you say to a young college age Akima Price about life or career? That's an interesting age because that's about the time that I stumbled upon this field of work. Um, I had no idea this was the direction I was going and I was, you know, like I've mentioned before, I was trying to go into radio. Um, I would tell myself wake up, don't sleep. This is a tremendous opportunity. I mean, thankfully, I didn't shy away from this work, but I don't think I had any idea that this would be the trajectory of my purpose on, plant, on this planet. You know what I mean? That I would be so inextricably bound to my purpose through my life's work, which happened to be my job, you know? And that was like an unconventional job. Like, who, even just like with our core now, like who thinks about working at a park other than just like being in a ranger booth or something. Like, it's just, I would tell myself to just keep going. Like again, don't underestimate the power of this work. Don't, don't just stay in the environmental lane. Don't, 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 don't rattle, agitate. You know what I mean? Follow, follow the passion of your heart, which is people. And, and nature and parks. And if it's not there yet, make it happen, pull it together. Just because it doesn't previously exist doesn't mean it can't happen or doesn't need to happen. Um, but you know, also do your research, find out what's out there. There's so much out there that I didn't know. So many other people doing very similar work um, who have the same passion for parks as clinics. Um, there's such an amazing body of work that again, you know, without being conscious and aware and willing to go new places and try new things, you wouldn't know it's out there. So definitely would tell, tell my young self to keep my mind open. Um, but yeah, and also keep my head up and be hopeful that this is meaningful, important work, that you can't really go wrong, you know, in this lane, for me at least. And they're talking to me, so I guess it works out. <laughs> Five words that describe Akima Price. Honest. Relentless, creative, generous, goofy. <laughs> <laughs> If environmental education or outdoor education didn't exist, which other field would you find yourself in? Um, probably, if not communications, I would, if it was my choice, I'd probably be in songwriting. Um, I do enjoy songwriting. I still do songwriting on the side here and there every now and then. Um, I was just thinking about even the songs I write still have a nature theme to them. Um, there's this song called This Is Me that this girl Devorah Bond sang. Um, the words are woke up, thankful for breathing and seeing and living and being a seedling about the burst straight to the ceiling. When I feel the light, I absorb all of the power that you so naturally provide, helps me shine. I walk in a grace unbeknowing to me. Every time I think I'm falling, I land on my feet. God willing, I keep growing, becoming what I was born to be. You so silly, Uggs. <laughs> Which books have been helpful in your work? So first of all, I read for information and not so much entertainment. And so sometimes I'm really hungry for specific information. So my reading's been all over the place. Um, but some of the most helpful book, book, books I think have been, um, one is by Ruby Payne. It's about the underpinnings, uh, the sort of framework to understand poverty. And so, you know, my, my lens with environmental education has always been from this 
have nots. Like these are people that are economically stressed and it makes a difference in how they think and do. And so her books and resources have been very helpful for me to kind of justify my thinking to other academics and say, hey, there's bodies of work that stand next to, you know, this, some of this stuff is very intentional and does need to be sort of called out and looked at. And it directly connected to a lot of the diversity and inclusion issues as well, because it came down to class. Nobody wants to talk about poverty, but Ruby, Ruby does it very well. Another helpful book for me uh, was by Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements that were really helpful for me going through and not, you know, kind of coming, falling prey to the racism that I was enduring uh, during those times. It helped me kind of maintain my sanity and still show up as a, as a decent human. Um, so some of those principles included one was, you know, always being impeccable with your word. Um, that was never anything super challenging for me. I, it gave me validation. It was okay that I was being honest about this work. Um, another, not taking things personally. I definitely personalized some of the actions I got back from people I shouldn't have. And this book was helpful and helped me realize the value in not taking things personally. Um, and then always doing your best. I mean, I think that's a given. We all kind of always show up and do that. But the most important was, was not making assumptions. Um, that was the, one of the biggest walkaways for me from that book. And I still use that book as sort of key agreements in the work I do with the core and most people. So definitely worth the read. And then the final book um, that is probably most memorable to me was by a, Iana Vassant. It's called Tapping the Power Within. And the book is pretty much, again, about self-empowerment. I seem to be in this theme of, so I told you, self-empowerment is my thing. Um, but that book was really helpful to me, too, in doing this work, because there's a lot of emotional labor in being an African-American in a field at the time that I was. And so that's probably why I sought out those type of books to kind of help me keep my peace, let alone, you know, increase my knowledge of different stuff. But more, I guess it was most important to me to keep my peace. It worked. <laughs> Akima, what is the deepest meaning of your work? Why do you do what you do? I do this work in hopes of breaking cycles, of helping families reprogram what family means, that everything doesn't have to always be done in survival mode, that people can actually catch up with themselves and see themselves and other people and not feel alone. Um, you know, there was a lot. Black communities were gravely impacted by the, you know, by slavery, the institution of slavery, and now by the institution of, you know, incarceration and like all these other intentional efforts. And, you know, trauma lives within the nature of the culture of those people. And so I'm focused on using parks and green spaces as ways to help these people rediscover themselves, maybe through just natural entombment with nature or through some intentional efforts of where it's you know, a space that you have new experiences that make you happy, that you can recall, that get you through tough times. I mean, the average person seeks out the park on their own. It's not like it's a hard sell. It's just maybe um, beefing up the, the, the type of opportunities that are available for people to have that maybe they realize help them in their lives somewhere, some way, beyond just a happy day at a cookout, but just like when you're really going through it like how can this park show up for you and help you in a way that's meaningful and cycle breaking. So in this work, you know, a lot of times I have to be brave. Um, I have to kind of ignore the existing infrastructure of rights and how it's supposed to be and what you're supposed to do and guidelines, you know, and it's not in disrespect. It's just that we're in different times in the environment. When you redefine an environment and redefine community, it includes so many more factors than what's been considered in traditional environmental education. And so, you know, you have to push forward. You have to, you know, not be afraid to be different or to sound different. You know, um, there's this one quote by Audre Lorde that helps me through and it gives me the strength I need a lot of times to be brave because it's, it's hard to do that in the face. Um, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. Because I feel like, you know, I was put here to do something and if that's what my vision says do, then I gotta do it. And so bravery, I think just being willing to be different and push up against the norm is probably the most important thing you can do. And so I encourage you to be brave and follow your heart. I think anytime you are looking from the lens of how to help someone as a human using nature, I think it's gonna end up being a win. I mean, that's just my biased opinion. <laughs> so, I mean, I, whoever's listening, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep seeking out, you know, 
more information, keep seeking out other ways to do it. But if you know, your heart is leading you to do this work to help people where they are, especially stressed people, keep doing it because nature is the answer, nature is the way.